Hello and welcome to NECC. This is week three. I am Light Rose and joining me is Treasure. And tonight we have Platteville. I think believe the, the B team versus NEC. Not NECC. You need to, <laughs> this is not an in-house team. But Easy mistake they, to make. Yeah, it's awful. It's awfully close. But so uh, how are you doing tonight on this lovely night, Treasure? Oh, I'm having a great time. I'm super pumped for this. It's week three. And I think the teams are all getting settled in here. We're going to start really seeing who separates out from the pack. I mean, right now, mm -hmm. Platteville is sitting there at a 1-1 record off their first two matches. New England College uh, had to have a reschedule for one of them, so they've got a 1-0. Both of them feeling not too bad after that one loss to trade between the two of them. But with this being week three, we're starting to get in the middle of the season. This is where you start pulling away. So this match is one that really tells how the rest of your season is going to go and starts getting that going. Yeah, we can look at some of the rosters for these teams. With Platteville, we've got Legally Dead, HM3, Rusty Tender, Breadstick, and Murray the Dope Fin. A lot of mechanical engineers on Platteville. There's actually, I think, five engineers. One of them is computer engineering, though. So just a little, a little funny that probably everybody just meets their major they go to classes together. So you could definitely assume that there's maybe a little bit of cohesion with this team. Yeah, a lot of math, too. So if you ever need them triangulating where someone's going to be through those walls, I think this is the team I'd be choosing <laughs> to be doing that because, sheesh, that is so much engineering between the five of them. Yeah, going on to NEC, we can see what they have to bring to us today. It's Bot, Pancake, Hatchet Thumb, Trosun. It's Trosun OP. The, the I is silent. And GK. So and you see it's New England College Esports and they don't have the, the same major, but I, I kind of like what they're bringing to the table in terms of uh, we got a history major, we got a criminal justice major, and of course we got a, a digital game and media design because of course doesn't every gamer love to, to make games as well. Yeah, so nice spread here on the other side. So maybe less of the eat, sleep, and breathe <laughs> the team, but a little more well-rounded maybe in those career paths that they're working on over at New England College. Yeah, now we can see the map bands. If we kind of scoot our way over there, we can see where we are going. We see the bands on the table. Chalet is going to be the first map. Cafe is going to be the second. And the third one, if we need it, is going to be border so the first pick is going to be platteville's and uh cafe dostoyevsky's is nec's pick yeah so all traditionally pretty aggressive maps that are pretty pick reliant so we're going to see that being a focus throughout tonight as we move our way through each of these three maps but chalet especially especially of the three as the lot of this the most offensively side of map that we've got going right now in the competitive map pool yeah, we'll see kind of th these maps are a little different, I think, than all of them, especially with Dostoevsky being a very vertical heavy map. It's one that's really fallen out. It's very specialist type of map pick. A lot of teams, you know, kind of want to go here if their vertical play is very strong. But I think other than that, it's a, it's a it's a map that really everybody knows how to deal with. I think that's why we don't maybe see it as yeah, I mean, it just takes its own individual skills. I mean, breaching the third floor is always just a beast of its own. And first floor can prove just really difficult to get into if you're not mm -hmm. clearing from top down. And if you are clearing from top down, the clock is not on your side all the way through cafe. Uh, Shelly similar really uh, does enthuse a lot of upward and vertical pressure from the top down if you want to deal with all the roamers and roamers are really strong throughout chalet yeah. between the west stairs and highway over by the side of the map like those could be pretty darn spooky positions if you have some roamers that are unanswered throughout the mid to late round and we'll see whether roamers have a real presence in this map or not. NEC starting out on the defensive side for Chalet, so they're going to be the ones to get any sort of advantage straight off the rip, potentially on the defense. But we're going to have to go through this ban phase, and I'm not expecting anything too crazy on this one. Maybe a Thatcher as well, because Chalet does lend itself to a little bit more hard reaches. So having Thatcher off the board just makes it a tad harder, despite the impact EMPs being being available absolutely especially in the basement and top floor so it's those really far apart ones vertically once again speaking but no it's not actually gonna be the thatcher like we might anticipate so he gets free reign he has been uh, a little 
some of the strength has been taken away from him with the uh, EMP secondary gadgets. So he's less of a high value pick nowadays since so that job can be done by a well-coordinated team. Anyway, so someone like Nook, who really is excels at taking out roamers or really uh, infiltrating her way into objective from behind places like Trench in the basement and uh, up on a, uh, a pincer movement on other objectives, just coming in on a side where maybe the rest of your four players are, makes it real easy for her to get some big kills if you've got a fragger on the attacking side. A Rooney, though, that is definitely something that's slightly deviating from the norm but with the aruni ban that's kaid and valkyrie open and one of those I and mean, maybe the second one is going to get played on the basement side it's so we're going to be heading first and it's a little surprising because teams kind of have actually started to avoid the basement more they prefer bar games kitchen the the master bedroom Better area so to go bar or excuse me basement Right off the bat, maybe that uh, that mute Kaid combo is definitely a little bit too strong. That Platteville is going to have a, a time to deal with. That's a lead denial. I mean, you have that almost auto include of the Jaeger still as well, so he's going to prevent some frag grenades from finding their way in. Uh, but there's a lot of hard breach available. Three hard breach and operators primary for now, at least until they see this objective and maybe switch some things up. Oh, I guess right as I speak, Nomad to cover up some of those runouts potentially, uh, both on French and by the window on our south side of the objective. Uh, still keeping an ace and taking out the thermite since he's a little bit of a harder time getting through all of that defensive denial that NEC has brought to the board. objective is to defuse a bomb. Yeah, interesting uh, noting today on if you watch like NAL, there was some decent bandit tricking, which is kind of surprising because you would think that, you know, and Thatcher used to get banned all the time. So bandit tricking got completely, you know, negated. It was useless at this point. But maybe we'll start to see a, a return of bandit tricking. I don't think we're going to see a Kaid trick. Pancake has one in the pocket that they really just might want to keep in case that, no, excuse me, that uh, Hatchet Thumbs Jammer gets taken out. But right now, just uh, it's time of droning, intel gathering. Flap will want to make sure that they know where they're going and we actually hit the execution button. If right now, NEC is a little more focused on that snowmobile garage wall than the attackers are. Platteville taking their time. I think the real uh, the real attack is coming over here through big garage, but they have been sighted. It's not going to be Murray who's up in the front, kind of taking a second seat back to Breadstick. But you really don't want to lose Breadstick early on. Hibana's has got those charges that are going to give value all the way throughout the ramp. So Murray with some uh, intel to give on some of these denial gadgets is really useful, but going to have to do it alone without Breadstick now. Oh, that does hurt losing your Habana, but if they can get the confirm onto the Jaeger, I don't think Murray can do that. They have to take a gamble, and it's a gamble that is not going to work out. The Jaeger should be able to be revived, and now you lose another member of your attacking squad. It's just HM3 and Legally Dead. Try to honestly potentially do the impossible. They haven't even gotten any of these walls open. The Impact EMP will allow that Thermite Charge to actually open it on up, but I feel like that's only step one. There's so many other areas that you're going to have to go through, including five defenders. Yeah, this is really falling apart pretty fast for University of Wisconsin. Platteville, they have two avenues of attack and already losing three players. They do have that wall open, just like you said, but you can't both funnel in through there with five players. There's so many angles to be watched. It's dangerous on its own. It's more of a tool to get into sight rather than the real door itself. And with two players out here, they're going to have a little bit of a hard time finding that avenue at all, especially with these long range sites between the two of them. And with 45 seconds, they just have to push. HM3, though, finds Pancake. That's a nice little headshot to start things going. At the very least, it won't be flawless. But these two just have to make the move, make something happen. Oh, you can see the, the recoil changes, makes it that. So that V308 just bounces so far. It's, just, it's so hard to control sometimes with HM3 taking a little bit more damage. Only 20 seconds left. All Platteville can really do is just wait outside for these defenders to come to them. Ghost Killer is going to get that final confirm. They started this round off and they're going to finish with NEC getting the first win on a basement site, no less. Yeah, they're feeling pretty comfortable right there. Actually, no real avenues into sight were challenged so heavily that they couldn't uh, deal with it too much. And a couple of them were kind of hungry for kills even. Uh, if you'll notice, Hatchet Thumb peeked up ahead of GK to try and get that second kill as fast as possible. So I think that roster is looking pretty hungry right now.
I mean, when you get that advantage, sometimes you just get a little spur of confidence. I think Ghost Killer getting that first kill definitely helps them a little bit. And maybe we'll potentially see them be more aggressive throughout the entire map. But, I mean, look who we've got on the board. I was talking about it a little bit last round. Bandit with the M870. Yeah, that's a, the media thing for me. I go, okay, shotgun out the hole, get that basic rotate in between sites. Super important there, especially while the lines of sites start getting locked down by an attack, especially from the window. But the shotgun is what is really exciting what we're seeing right there. It will kind of limit his options though. So Pancake's gonna have to close up some angles, maybe anchor up a little bit more if the other teammates are gonna focus up on that roam. And I think that Pancake Attack may be focused on just that little office corner. Hatchet Thumb being on the mute, that allows for, you know, doorways to be covered, any other uh, reinforcements to be covered by that mute jammer. That's why mute is so strong, in my opinion. He has a wide range of coverage that he and his mute jammers can get. He's got four of them. He can get two mute jammers. He can't cover all of the wall, but if, you know, you're smart, you... Shut off lines of sight. I think that's the, the big thing with Mute is Hatchet Thumb has a shotgun. Bot's got a secondary shotgun. Pancake's got a shotgun. There's just so much destruction that NEC brings to these soft walls. Yeah, I'd say those SAS boys are up there. Two of the top three for best utility gadgets just have to be dealt with by the attackers at some point in time. Attackers Jaeger, though, is going to be going down. Uh, looks like Ghost Killer is caught out on that rotate, trying to get away from the fight before it was too much, but Breastick is pushing up really far uh, to start things off. Now that's that aggression is going to be punished sometimes. As, you know, it, It's going to reward you, but also if you know the attack reads into it it's just as easy as that you could see that murray was really ready for ghost killer and it seems that nobody else is really on a hard roam everybody else is in sight bot is po probably the closest around piano he should spot the laser and he definitely oh, does but the drone spots him as well so i think that uh that's gonna be spelled right then and there some mutual information. Ooh, but continuing to fire gives away his location for good that he has decided to stay on the angle. So he's going to take that one away and knows that piano is going to be clear for a second until someone has the opportunity to rotate using that ACOG to get line of sight down the hallway. Cams have to go away and make sure everyone's ready to go up here by trophy staircase where they're so darn close to an encounter. Uh, Trosun can really get a power play. I don't know if they heard the, the, the oh. rappel in, but the did for sure, but Murray has a great angle. They take out Trosun, and Breadstick might be able to get revived as once again, there are only shotguns on the board. Hatchet has the machine pistol, but not anymore. It's going to be a flawless round coming off of this first round loss, so already it seems we're in due for a back and forth game. That's a good thing to see. That's really wild to see such a stark difference between the rounds. I think only one taken for them in the first round. They come back with a vengeance coming up to that second floor. We'll see if the defenders want to go back in the face of a flawless round. I mean, those are always going to feel bad, kind of take a hit to morale as far as what, how your hold is doing for yourself. But it looks like they're they're playing with it and switching some things around. That same bandit that we were looking at before has been switched out for a lesion. Hmm. Defenders so uh, I think that's a, a big change as well because I mean now you're you're gonna have that Kaid instead so you're gonna have to dedicate all two of those laws if you're gonna want to get the entire coverage so I, I think you get the the AUG A3 you get a C you still get the C4 so I I don't think too much changes here treasure it's just about you know where's ghost killer gonna play is nec gonna spread more roamers about around the map that those are the things that can honestly make a difference yeah i have to say ghost killer is already making really high impact plays that that flawless round was on the back of losing Ghost Killer first, and the first one I did see Ghost Killer find three. A couple of them were kind of after everything was done and dusted, though. But in two rounds, that gives me a sense that maybe Ghost Killer is going to be a key for NEC, especially keeping them alive and keeping them on the roll. You're looking at where everybody is. Ghost Killer is actually on board. that top floor. They are around the Sunroom. That is where they could be headed, and potentially somebody else has the honors of spreading themselves around the map we see four on site but pancake 
Legally Dead went up so quick and they got punished for it. They just were not prepared for somebody angled at that door. That was good. We actually got to see that Barricade getting punched out early, and that's kind of impactful because I think it's Pancake too doing that for revenge because Legally Dead was waiting up there, droning through the game, set up a C4, and was watching that angle through the rotate in between objectives, just holding the line aside and waiting to get that kill, and it made it so much easier for them to execute the last couple kills last round. Things get evened up here, though, on the other side of the map as Boo finds one on the Rome hatchet. Thumb is going to be bomb located by attack. That's going to make it a lot easier to get up into Piano Room just like they did last round. And here is Ghost Killer could potentially get another one. The flash's gonna go through, just potentially scare them off as they actually go right down the stairs. And there's Murray once again waiting with open arms. It's twice, two rounds in a row now that Ghost Killer has died at the hands of the IQ. Trojan is gonna replace them, but oh, through the floor, Murray. Murray gets the wall bang. Actually, does a little bit of damage to their teammate, but I, I think that's more than enough considering the kills they got. And, and, and a third so one to boot. Murray happy on the trigger finger and it is paying off well. Boo, despite getting in for nearly free after that first kill, is going to be taken down by Pancake, but Pancake does not get to stay around for long because reinforcements are just around the corner and an AK-12 is a strong weapon to have in those hands coming right from that window. It's the same place that he died from last time as well, the little balcony outside. If it's not from the door, it's going to be from someone running on in through the window. Okay, maybe we should like take our eyes off of Ghost Killer and reposition them onto Murray. I think that That's is, what I'm uh, yeah, one, one just having a little bit more of an impact than the others so far. I think uh, a 3k in that round and, Attackers and need to locate previously put up numbers. So, so far they have five in the three rounds, most in the lobby as the basement is where we're going to be headed. And what changes is Plantville going to bring that will actually help them out here? I see an ace this time, uh, swap it over the Thermite, which could be a good change, but the Thatcher, I think, could be the big difference. Yeah, I think that really remedies some of the problems that we saw immediately in round one when we were back on basement, which we do note the defense has opted to go back to immediately upon getting the opportunity to, and for good reason. They only lost one player on their team in that round, but this time with those adjustments being able to be made, uh, I guess instead of the Thatcher, it's the Osa, but I also like Osa on this objective, either for going on the west or the east side of the map. Makes it a little easier to attack the breach, makes it a little easier to deal with that peak fight that inevitably, inevitably pops up on Trench in the basement. It also does have that impact EMP that if they sneak a drone through the that drone hole, they spot out the electro claw, then it's pretty easy to actually deal with it. The only problem is actually getting your drone in there. But I think the IQ is immediately gonna take that. Surprising IQ is over by uh, a small garage. She's not tasked with taking out that cayenne claw. She's assisting breadstick. I think that's exactly what she was doing in the previous round. And now as uh, they continue to go forward. This could be a very similar round, but hopefully with different results if you're a fan of Platinum. All right, GK once again spotted on the realm. Very similar spot to where he's died the last two rounds, so he wants to get on out of there. Don't want to repeat that once again because the attacks have been pretty scary over there. Murray very specifically, and Murray once again is getting droned around, looking for another kill to keep padding up that KD. The drone sneaking in just like you thought would be so impactful, and this is a nice spot to be at because they can keep eyes on Kaid, but not for too long. Now the hole is going up, though they know Kaid isn't at it but they suspect he might be trying something. Oh, and now it's the mental game. Pancake actually scared them off of the Thermite Breach, and we didn't actually know if the Kaiyu Claw was on there. That kind of seems to be the, the go-to right now, is Habana and IQ still over in Small Garage. Ghost Killer still alive on that first floor. Right now, it's just kind of... No bullets have really been fired, but you can just tell that Platteville knows that one roamer is up on this first floor. Blue, Boo is tasked to take them out. It's going to be Brenstick, the first casualty taken out by Bond, who's crouched just behind the blind cellar. Now, that, that hurts a lot of your northern push. GK has been keeping a lot of the team busy. Two players on the attack. Uh, so just 
trying to find him. They're finally drawing him out. He's had a drone right ahead of him this whole time. Kept eyes on it. Oh my god. But evading yet another one. He's playing the mind games and he's going to find the headshot. A couple he shots on the body as well as Murray's a lowered health at this point. She plays the advantage in the fight. But the higher optic, the 1.5 times that Murray gets to wheel here is going to be advantageous when he gets against the longer angles. GK smartly gets on out of there but keeps soft walls between them. That's just not going to do it. You've ever played uh, Team Fortress 2? I think at this point, this is where the, the domination uh, sound effect yeah. would be played. And uh, a little crown shot. would appear above <laughs> Murray's head. That's three in a row now that he's it, killed uh, Ghost Killer. But I think right now, Murray has to do a little bit more as Bot gets left. their second of this round. And HM3 is just going to go straight yeah, down. And you could tell they just were not prepared. NEC completely wiped the floor with Platteville, who just, at the end, they're just rushing. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, about as unprepared as you could get right there. Yeah, I think that Vendetta is kind of getting the best of Murray, actually. They're spending so much time. Before that real cat and mouse encounter got into the thick of it, we are already down half of action phase, a minute and a half to work with, and without the major breach open into Snowmobile Garage with uh, your main fragger out there still looking for the roamer. They've just invested too much time, energy, and resources into dealing with one bomb. player while there's still four more sitting in objective. And Attackers I think this is switch the location of a bomb. Going with a couple times really was going to be necessary to get a basement attack going because two foiled attempts in a row are what you're looking for. But I'm honestly surprised that Murray, yes, is getting kills. Obviously, he's got six, but I, I don't know exactly what the point of like sticking him with Havana there in small garage having IQ over by snowmobile garage I think it, you get so much yeah, more value amazing. out of the scanner with the Osa you can put that impact EMP down you, five seconds left. you know kind of make sure the kite actually sticks down and Oof. well that's gonna hurt a little bit as the it seems that the floorboards are more important than your teammates that that's a little unfortunate pancake hopefully got all of their utility down here plenty of frost mats but that might not be the case they do take a while to get the full setup so down one going into this even round two two back to back it has been a real back and forth half so that's not the worst situation but you really don't want to fall behind on such a small blunder as that that hurts for sure because with Frost, you do have that secondary shock done that, you know, maybe through the round, you just need a small rotate. Uh, she's got that 1.5. I don't actually know if she did get the deployable shield down. We weren't really able to to see, but I think that there is one right there, but we don't know if it's hatchet thumb. So, yeah, okay. She did, she did get both down. So all utility seems okay. to have been deployed, but you're still a gun down, which I think is, yeah. is, is this the most. Yeah, I'd rather have a gun than utility, but the utility can do a lot for you right now. Uh, unfortunately, most of it is put there in library where uh, University of Wisconsin is not taking that bait. They're not too interested in pushing over to taking some side angles down through a large garage once again. And Boo is taking this opportunity to head in through office and try and catch someone off guard. They've got drones up ahead of them. They should be feeling pretty darn safe. They know that they'll get the drop on anyone they find in the hallway. Yeah, of course, the army of drones assisting Boo as Bot has an alternative angle on this window as there's Legally Dead and HM3 who just, they're trying to get different angles. You can see with that H charge creating just a, a hole, even in the soft wall, Legally Dead is going to use their first lion charge. And right now, yeah, th this is completely an office-sided push. They're trying to create a lot of chaos and push these defenders away from the power position that is the second floor of library. But by the longer that they hold on to us, the more valuable they become. Yeah, Trojan here is the most important player for the defense right now. Holding that shield, they've got some defense to help him. A headshot! <laughs> oh, a great little spray there from the SMG-11. Looking for a second one, but it's just not there. Didn't even see the breadstick had moved on over. And with their own machine pistol, is going to pick this one up. Highway now taken fully from the attack. They're in a much better spot with one kill up. Bot, though, has been hiding in that corner, waiting for an opportunity. It shows itself, but it's only a trade out as who finds him. But the floorboards, these that is a kill for the attackers. But now, really getting another one for the defenders as Boo hangs on with just a sliver of their remaining health. Hatch of them has the option to redeem their fallen comrade. They still have so many Shumika launchers in their back pocket. It's a hard gadget to get true. You 
utilization out of, but we have a lot of opportunities to use them. The hatch is going to be destroyed. HM3 is going to drop, take some fire damage, and immediately starts dropping the diffuser down. Chachaka's going to find one, and so does Jaeger, who gets their second with NEC. Despite having less numbers, they immediately swing back once that plant really started to go down. It's the time game again. Platzel is toying a little too much with the clock. At 15 seconds, you could see that hustle on the faces of all of their players. They just need to get in. And where that's starting to hurt them a lot is 15 seconds left, putting that diffuse down with a site that is definitely not cleared. It has such a chonk, and you're already eating fire damage to get in. HM3 just wasn't set up for success there. Like You just can't execute that yet. If the most powerful position to deny plant manned by a chonk of all characters Attackers is still Locate and defuse bombs. Uh, so, CEO, we've been here twice, and both times it was a Platteville win. But here's the thing, they don't really have any other option, is what I would say if Kitchen was an option. So, NEC, maybe they just don't have it in their strat book, they're not confident going to Kitchen. But CEO is still, or not CEO, excuse me, uh, Master Bedroom is still testing Platteville. I think it's it's not one that I really feel confident about NEC coming back here. Ten seconds left before insertion. Yeah, uh, well, wait, uh, second floor was the, the flawless defense for NEC, is right? So this de is... Defense or? Yeah, so okay. this one should be. I thought it was, the, I thought it was a, flawless, just... uh, a flawless attack for Platteville. Oh, I hope the second I didn't one. counter wrong. Well, I don't know yeah. how to read barely. <laughs> the, fir the first round write, was an so. NEC a win on basement. Platteville then won two in a row, one of them being a flawless, and NEC has now won two in a row, one on basement, one on bar. I believe that's kind of how it's oh, come together. Is, that is such that a... That is unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, and that's such, a, that's such a big investment, too. That's a, one of the most Jagger. important uh, deployable shields or... Uh, walls to set up at all is right there on piano does so much for you So hopefully one more will be in the pocket to throw over there on piano and keep uh, running But otherwise he's just gonna be playing at a disadvantage once players come up to face him uh, Right now there's not an immediate effort for it Pancake is on all wide from looking for someone in the basement I think that's wise actually seeing as how many times Murray's come through here and the Claymore is gonna probably deter Pancake from making a really long flank, but I don't. I think in the long term, Pancake isn't probably going to to follow Murray. I would expect them to possibly head all the way back up to you know second floor. Maybe I I don't know. Pancake, <laughs> the roaming Kaiheed isn't what you usually expect. I mean, it's a character that it's okay to lose, and he's got armor to keep fighting. Um, I'm not sure who found the down right there, but Pancake. Pancake is... Okay, cool. That's paying off pretty well, holding that power position on the stairs in main lobby. Just can't confirm the kill, not even with that scoped pistol, and legally dead is playing carefully around the down teammate, holding up the angle so that a res can be gone without too much risk. It pays off with that first kill, and they're still up with that player, just at decreased health for now. Oh, the unfortunate thing about that was Ghost Killer actually saw them right there. But Pancake, it is going to play off. They get one, but Breadstick follows up with two of their own. And it seems Platteville are going to continue their streak on this site. But Bod drops the Diffuser, puts a Legion Mine on it, and they have to get three more if they want to secure this round. And it's not even going to be any more as HM3 Town. So 3-3 three, three is where we end up on Chalet. And it could have really been a different story if that second floor defense was a little stronger for NEC. Yeah, that's uh, really reading exactly how it felt all the way down there. These back and forth rounds for the most part between these two teams. Uh, really objective based too. So we'll see how the defense of Platteville is really going to square up against this. They have a very different mindset we can already tell from this first play on Master Bedroom. And with a different lineup of operators too, a castle is coming out to play. Attackers need to the castle is actually a very usual operator he's a familiar operator on this site because he you know you soak up some utility on that one door you can kind of sh shut down piano door as well certain windows like the the double window as well castle i i like castle as you know as he's got the ump it's not done but it does have the 1.5 he's got the super shorty he's got the you know proximity alarms come on Castle's kind of fun, you have to admit it, and you're- Oh, he's so much fun. Down. He is. Ten seconds left. 
Nah, the little, the little lasers, all reliable. I mean, it ain't got the damage, but if you've got the flick, it just feels so darn good to be wielding that, man. The power that you give to the team repositioning the opponents is, you know, it can give you those 300 IQ plays sometimes. You can funnel them exactly where you want if everything goes to plan. Right now, I think he's more of a utility sink, though, especially with the windows being barricaded out. It makes it a little harder or at least a little more of a time and energy sink to get up into piano room and aggress on that very well. So, looking at the operators on both sides, Ghost Killer on the Thatcher, a Finca from Hatchet Thumb. I think it's the first time I've actually seen Finca being brought since the changes to the recoil. The spear is going to be brought by Hatchet Thumb. They don't want to test the, the changes. Maybe you see how good they are at absolutely bringing their mouse down on their mouse. Yeah, rest in peace to them. And a rest in peace and a salute to the absolutely most brain dead way to play this game ever. It was truly amazing. Uh, MP goes off here right in time for those pieces to pull up that wall. Some charges doing their job, getting all four explosions and HM3s, trying his best to keep a line of sight on that. He's pinned here behind the couch, so he doesn't have any option except to challenge the breach. Boo, though, is making it so it's going to be harder for the attackers to get in here. They have to answer him before they can actually hop in through that wall and try to do a plant because that's a nice angle down from the stairs. So far, Ghost Killer has been the opening death three rounds in a row. Ever since that first round, they really haven't found success when it comes to really being the opener. As uh, you know, three out of their five has been the first one. Is HM3? I, I feel like this is a risky position. If they're caught out, then it's not they're going to risky. be a successful defense on Platteville. But Boo over here could really test to metal as Breadstick takes out Bond and makes it so that you know losing one player on Platteville isn't going to be the worst thing in the world. Ooh, Hatchet Thumb trying to make a play of their own. The smoke grenade going in. Plenty of health to play aggressively like this, able to keep stimming, but with fewer players on the board, a split push like this kind of starts to lose its value. Someone's got to make a play on the other side of the map. Chersnop goes for it, but Boo's going to take him out, making a great presence on the stairs. And here comes uh, reinforcements. Hatchet Thumb and Pancake up here, but missing that Malusi ba uh, Banshee is going to hurt. Breadstick gets the kill, legally dead down as well. Now is Pancake, oh, just does not make it happen with the pistol there at the very end. Well, one team has taken the lead for the first time. Platteville, Air, they're, they're back to their old leading selves. They were leading in round three, and now that we've reached round eight, they're back on top. But I think their defense could really be the star of the show. They could continue to string together these rounds with Bar Gaming. As long as their frost doesn't die first, I feel a lot better about their chances on bar gaming, which you could say Attackers is an equally defender sided site. Because if you hold that second floor, it's so hard as an attacker to really get stuff done. I think the rum is what's really making the difference right now for Beautiful Platform. Murray does such a good job of dismantling. Uh, Ghost Killer, who is the main roamer throughout all of the defending side of Rums for NEC. So, with Boo finding huge, huge success, I mean, those were the two most pivotal kills from stairs of that entire round. And just totally unanswered. Charge Op made an effort to, but it was too late in the round and with two little drones still up to actually find that info that they needed. Uh, we just got to do their job perfectly throughout that round. Switching up the guns a little bit, a little more recoil to deal with, a little less range to be really effective after finding those headshots. But still, a rifle is exactly what you want to be taking a similar kind of fight. Mm -hmm. Alibi, I'm surprised. This is the first time that we have seen Alibi in this game. If you looked at the most recent uh, developer notes, which were the, included the balance changes, you would see that Alibi is the most played defender, and it is by a good margin. She has a good win rate as well, so I wouldn't be surprised to find any <laughs> nerfs, but HM3 gets taken out by Hatchet Thumb, and that's a big kill because now... That's another gun we talked about it earlier. Losing a gun really hurts. Reloading. Yeah, and is that legally dead? Just taking a peek right around the corner. That is a risky thing to be doing, especially when you're on smoke. You don't have anything that can challenge the range of a 5.56 XI. He's got a good spot to be working with, but it's not good for uh, contesting that window at all. And NEC is just moving into the office over here. They got the hard breach. They got some rotate holes through the soft hole to be 
working with extra quickly and they got full line of sight down highway where actually that shield is now totally unmanned there's an alibi watching it but no players and that is the best spot to be for the defenders the fact that no one's rotating over there is really worrisome for the defense right here Bot and Hatch Thumb take a lot of damage, but Legally Dead gets downed and eliminated. Boo is still inside of this library. Osa with a shred of HP Bot with still a good amount to take a play, but Pancake with the Diffuser gets taken out. Both Murray and Boo take one of their own, but unfortunately, Boo can't get any more than the one, so it's going to be up to Murray in a 1v3. Two of those members on about one to two bullets worth of HP. This is definitely winnable, but now you can see it's a little chaotic. They have to look at the hash and they can't even get the one kill. So NEC immediately swing back and tie this one right back up. Hatch at them. Getting the first kill, getting the last kill, opening things up and closing them down. Murray not getting really any opportunity to shine. They're holding up that anchor position, which is the best spot to be in, but not when you don't have any teammates in that 1v3 with time still up on the clock. Hatch them, bringing back that Osa has already been quite trusty in that last round. And uh, it it's, looks like an attack with quite a bit of versatility. They expect uh, that same objective once again, uh, especially with it being that second pick for the defenders. Attackers need to locate and yeah, so bomb. going down two bar cap can this time for breadstick So no more alibi. You don't have the shield, but you do have those cap can traps, which Surprisingly after this long despite cap can being a real threat in some of these uh, competitive games Players still get taken out by his cap can traps. It's just Sometimes it, it feels so easy. It's just like, oh, look at the door. But it's like the same as Frostman. It's just like, oh, look down. But still, they they find kills. Uh, you can't. You just can't check every single door, especially when you know there's someone up around that angle or when the timer's coming down. I mean, that's where these operators really make things count. On the reverse side, Platfield was having a bit of a hard time letting the round come down to the wire. So I think they're looking for that same thing to see from NEC with the cab can frost and smoke if NEC dawdles for any of their time they're gonna be quickly taken apart just trying to use the objective I don't think uh, HM3 is gonna test their luck against hatchet them but the changes from the attacking side pancake on the capital I think capital is kind of the go-to when it comes to okay we don't want to bring a hard but we obviously need to bring you know maybe the, the hard breach gadget Capital is what teams seem to reach for. And what do you, what do you think it is about Capital that just because he's got the hard reach gadget, the teams want to bring him? Oh, he's a three speed and his pockets are full of little trinkets and uh, goodies. Like he, he's got two fry, fire, two smoke. The hard breach, uh, he's got solid guns at his disposal. I mean, the pars, uh, fire rate is a little bit low, but the recoil is definitely his friend. So he has quite a bit to work with. And it's great in that supporting role if you don't need a really fast support or a hard breach to be going down. The attack are pushing up really quickly here. A couple angles and a red stick down. The walls are starting to close in around UW platform way more quickly than you'd expect. Oh, if Ghost Killer gets taken out, they do. That evens this one up. But Legally Dead still holds that position up on the mezzanine. And now they're going to deploy their first smoke canister. Just try to deter the rest of NEC for now with HM3 there. I... It's going to take a little bit of attacking magic to get this one done. A frag grenade, a firebolt, something is going to have to destroy that shield. Otherwise, HM3 is just going to be able to fire down that hallway, get a shooting range. But Bot takes them out as soon as they peek from the shield. They find another one, but Boo equals it all on up. And once again, it, we're at a 2v3 with Boo and Murray left. Boo gets one. Can they get a second? Yes, they do. They drop the diffuser, pull out the pistol, but are taken out when they try to drop the hatch. 50 seconds left. It's Trozon versus Murray, each on full health. They've got a great mags, and now I think it's going to be about time. It's going to be about information, but I think there's a lot for both to work with here. Yeah, like the Trojan immediately gets on that cam as soon as he finds a good spot to be in. He needs some intel to work with because nothing has come from the team. He's got a suspicion of where there's going to be, and there we go. It is confirmed. Drone's going to be gone, but he's got something to work with. And Murray has to make the decision. Is this a 
a strong spot to stay, or do I need to leave and try and throw off the intel? He's gone with staying. You know, he's got an angle on left. all of these rooms. There's no place to plant that he's not going to have some bit of noise or Ten visual cues to work with. Chosen lost for just a second. That turnaround might be a problem, though, with that pre fire coming out. And Murray moving all around now in the final moments of the round gets behind the bar. Pre fires that angle. He knows that's where the attack has to come from. So I, what they could not do was clutch out the round. It's a little less pressure, but, eh, you know, a, a win is a win in these scenarios. So right now, five to four, this is such a back and forth game right now between these two teams. There's, you know, sometimes positioning is getting exploited by these attackers on Platteville. I think you look back at, you know, HM3 a couple rounds ago, attackers. maybe uh, this master bedroom would be made a little bit different than it was all the way back in the, the seventh round for NEC as they, you know, uh, come away with the win here. And that would put Platteville on map point, and, you know, one round away from giving themselves the win. I think the most impactful plays we've been seeing so far are from Boo and Bot so far. Some alliterative names, only one letter of difference, but Boo getting really big kills, two kills on Roams twice uh, in these last three rounds. Uh, last round he died to Bot, to actually. The other one who makes some really quick progress through Highway, taking out whoever's playing the shield like immediately. And that's such a big hump to get over while you're attacking Attackers the bar objective gaming objective that he's really given his team the luxury. And while they didn't win last round, they got it down to the 1v1 hugely in part due to that effort from him. And previously, they won really handedly off of it. The defenders still trying to continue their prep phase, reinforcing utility placement as the Sunroom seems to be a good position that NEC kind of likes to hold on. You see, I mean, that's kind of overall what teams like to play. You remember Murray going up trophy. You remember Breadstick holding on to the window. I think NEC are trying something similar. But now you've gotten bought immediately by that trophy door. If Breadstick is not ready for the rush that bot could potentially do and maybe take them by surprise i don't think that's gonna happen but you never know it's kind of like what if yeah bot doesn't even know the power of that position they hold right now with no one in objective and covering of all those lines of sight but he's gonna play safe keeping that pixel peak in case someone tries to run out on him waiting for his teammates to get some better positions but there is a bit of a trap set murray in the same position he was playing last round still all the way down there in that wine uh, closet, uh, the supply closet for the bar, at least, waiting for someone to air it on by and just walk past him. Boo also looking for a pretty reactive uh, position, just lying in wait in the basement. HM3, I like, I kind of like this position that they have off screen. It's Boo who takes out Trosen, who just was not prepared. There is Hatchetham claiming Breadstick and HM3 barely going to squirm away with their life as Boo gets another one that's Pancake and that's the Hard Breach. So that Electro Claw doesn't even need to be there anymore. But Bot taking out Murray, that is one of your top fraggers. But Boo. They are still alive. They are still breathing despite the amount of HP Attackers left. And so is HM3. The HP advantage could be what gives NEC the win, but they need to, sh to make sure they take these gunfights one on one. And that starts with Ashatham on these stairs. They do spot the body and they take it out. And so does Bot. So now I 3v1 with NEC. Two, uh, well, actually, not just one kill away from tying it up 5v5. And there it is. Legally dead and alive taken out as now the maximum regulation rounds are guaranteed love to see it so we're in and keeping this one alive all the way through back and forth truly on this half for every round so going into round 11 we're back up to second floor we're seeing a repeat of quite a few of these rounds really running it back we'll see if the lineups change much there's no castle for starters often instead for that malusi so a little bit less uh utilities will need to be or soft destruction utility will need to be used uh, but i think that's the move anyways with bot being so successful attackers. on sledge he's just gonna stay around through the round and smack through each of those that he sees what do you think about going back to the second floor do you like that i don't like that i don't feel like given the the previous record that's exactly what nec did they tried to go back to the second floor 
it, it wasn't successful. I, th th there's a very obvious track record here, Treasure. Well, they did get it in round one, so a little better off than their opponents were in the same situation. But it's going to take some adaptation. It's been close rounds for sure, either way. Uh, and if they're just not confident uh, in the third site to go to, then I, I can't argue with that. But you really don't want to be giving these like 50-50 track record rounds up, uh, especially if you're pulling out some of the same tricks. Murray's playing in the exact same space. I assume we will be back in the basement again because that's where he's been finding that success. But the attack has to be aware of this. Someone has to be going down other than just hatchet them to go and find Boo because that has been such a problem for him. Immediately an air jab goes down, but that's not going to stop Boo. Yeah, already going into the very open area. There is legally dead. They are down for the count. As ghost killers, just, yeah, they are legally dead. So now a smoke off the board with not even in the first minute. No smoke canisters. Only one C4 for plants now, and that really hurts this defense, especially now that that wall is open. And once again, we have barely scratched one minute in the round. Ooh, and HM3 is going to go down the couch position. Doesn't work out. It's risky, just like we were saying. And having GK up on that repel is going to offer even more lines of sight. So the attack is looking absolutely just squanching the defense. Breadstick does find a stand here and Boo's in the same spot as before. Here's that air jab. He's trying to find it. I think make sure that's going to be safe to move on up. He's going to have to with only Breadstick left anywhere near the site. And he's still on piano. It's a peripheral room. Oh, there is one. Couldn't more be following as there is one right by the diffuser and one by the piano door. Britsic actually going to push up and reload. There is a Mew Jammer and a Banshee covering it, so drones are not going to have it. But just a small hole in the soft wall is more than enough for Ghost to go to find okay, one. But he's going to get taken out as Boo. They are going to have to put this team on their shoulders to get to Matt points there's two members left to go two talon shields that nec could actually set themselves up for success but there's goes ghost killer hatch of thumb is gonna fake the diffuser immediately gets off of it and tries to go for the angle but boo goes off of it right as hatch of thumb starts to go into their vision hatch of thumb backs off behind the talon shield just holding the same angle as right now with 50 seconds left neither of them really have to take this angle hatch of thumb is actually going that time to put down a shield and there we go they are go probably going to stick this diffuser as boo is not going to enter the site they're actually going to go outside back into the window but through the breach they find the kill and find the round win and that just felt unwinnable the way that hatch was playing that wow it was such smart plays from hatchet them except for not putting that diffuser all the way down. He had some time. He heard the running, so he knew it was time to act on that. But Boo is kind of on fire right there. A 3k for the clutch. Just continuing to go. I think that's 15 kills in the round. So this isn't just a standout performance. You know that he's been putting up those numbers. So you know you got to play smart. You got to play to the objective. So I think not putting down the diffuser there. Definitely not the play. Because you know that a vault uh, and several more steps of run. There's just plenty of time for that last like second or so of the bomb to go down and get the rifle back up, especially behind that protective shield from the Osa. That's the thing is they, they had the shield. If Boo had hopped outside, they would have had like a brief second to react because he would say like opponent detected outside, which would be enough to potentially whip your crosshair around find the kill so I, everything felt in hatchet thumbs court it, it felt like they had all the opportunities and yet here's boo with 15 kills leading the charge and putting platteville on map point as bar gaming i believe that is where we're going to be headed once again and last time we were here it was a platteville win but it was the 1v1 that murray did win against uh, i think I believe it was trojan yeah, we've had two really good 1v1s. What are you just full attention on the edge of your seat here? What are they going to do with special? That last one I think is going to be great to go back on and advise. Be like, boo, absolutely on fire. Somewhere you do not think that the defenders could win at all and just blazes a tear of chaos up to upstairs. He's nowhere near it. From the basement to the second floor, killing anyone in sight. You know, it's almost like like a cause, like 1v1 me on Russ. I'm running around with the MP5, just cannot be stopped. <laughs> Well, Hatch of them actually did peak 
but they had they had their shields, so the, the angle just wasn't there for Legally Dead to kind of take them out. But here's Ghost Killer being very, very sneaky going up these library stairs. If they emerge to that second floor, or even potentially the site itself, they could immediately throw this round into chaos. But they were not prepared for HM3, who was absolutely prepared for them. Yeah, and that's something that they should have been a little bit more aware of. That's a position you have to hold on this site up there at the top of the stairs. So uh, he just was single-minded looking for Murray in that closet. It's just not to be, especially here with the Breadstick taking on Pancake. It's going to give a lot more freedom to the roamers on UW Platform. We don't need to rotate if they feel any pressure at all. Oh, I think one more kill, especially on bot, could make sure that Platteville secure this map. There it is. Overtime could be avoided, but Breadstick can't find the second one. They can't find the, the nastiest flick that we could have seen as we're at a 2v4. Trosen and Hashitham have to push their way up onto Mezzanine, despite the Castle Barricade. Despite these reinforcements, it's going to be up to them with, honestly, a real lack of good offensive utility in the situation that they are in. They can't do anything to get rid of the shield. They can't do anything to get rid of these reinforcements. Not a lot is in their odds. Yeah, these two got to play smart and they got to play fast with less than a minute. And these defenders kind of pushing up on them, keeping up that pressure. Those smoke grenades take up a lot of time and they're outnumbered two to one right now. Hatchet Thumb has the shield out, but it's not going to pick up kills that way and they need them fast. 37 seconds on the clock. Down on game point here, they could lose this map in just two clicks. Two headshots on Hatchet Thumb and Trojan. I would be very impressed if we saw two headshots just like that. I think it might be a little bit messier than that, as right now, they're actually slinking their way into the site. Murray takes a bit of damage as they are in that supply closet, but it has definitely been communicated where the rest of NEC arm. I would expect Hatchet them to actually put down the shield and put the diffuser down as Murray gets taken out. Now, Gladville have to go back into the site. It's a 2v2. Hatchet them should put this diffuser down, and they do. Is now beef. It's a 2v1. The Nomad no Air Jab hatches up, can't find the kill! And that could be the dagger! That means Platteville could win this one out. Hashatham backs on up and they can't find the kill! And it was presented on a Defenders silver on platter treasure! Oh, that's so, so sad to see Trojan put everything on the line, finding those two kills, evening the odds. He goes down for the diffuser to land, but. Down on map point, UW finds that round. They close in even with that air jab. They still had one up even if that kill were to have gone off, sadly, for the attackers. But NEC just cannot quite take it to overtime. Uh, I just, I, uh, it, it, sometimes you have those things happen as treasure is a picture now he, he makes me kind of look silly as he's just staring at me my camera's like, going glitchy mode unfortunately yeah i i i, I, sure I we'll get yes. that back that is why but it is still kind of funny that i'm like at a video and then you're just like a picture who's just kind of like staring at me i will stare back at you but yeah that was the first map of this one plantville versus uh nec yeah, so we'll be back. Our next map, like we mentioned before, is going to be Cafe. And then if this one goes to NEC, then we get to go on to a third one on Border. But we'll be back in just a few minutes after a quick break.
All right, howdy everybody. We are back. I'm Skull Treasure. I'm still joined by the beautiful Light Rose. We're continuing our match in action. UW Platteville B team versus New England College. So University of Wisconsin Platteville is up our first match in LA by their hand after a really close back to back regulation just shy by one round of going into overtime. So that's gonna give you a little bit of an idea of what we're looking for going here into Cafe, our second map of the night. So this was, if I remember correctly, NEC's pick. It's a little mixed up at the top, but NEC is starting on the attacking side, Platteville. It is actually a little confusing. I think that's Platteville is like on NEC side and NEC's oh. on Platteville side, just by Platteville having the, the one map. It, it doesn't even matter, but NEC, this is their map pick. They are starting on the attacking side. And how do you feel about them? starting the same the bands that they're bringing the kaid uh, do you like the the thatcher ban here compared to like a nook um i i don't i'm not a huge fan of the, the nook ban in the best of cases like unless it's a target ban something that you've been dealing with consistently usually if you've like played against that team before you really had the material to uh review and i can't say for sure if that's been something that they've used a lot but Nook can only do so much, and she can also be pretty easily countered uh, just by holding with that in mind, honestly speaking. So I definitely think a Thatcher is going to do a lot more for you, especially for uh, Platteville to be putting it down to defend on Cafe, because especially on first floor, Thatcher just rips apart the walls. Mm -hmm. Very, very true. And with how important a lot of times that wall can be, with entire strategies dedicated just with holding the wall that thatcher can just kind of throws a wrench can. in that so going to the third floor there isn't going to be as much wall denial because walls aren't the biggest play here it's just about holding on to cigar and holding on to i think um the actual sites themselves especially the one near cigar shop so we'll see what the attack wants to do here brent stick on the maestro i do like that the, the cameras can be a very powerful play especially Especially when you get late into the rounds, you don't have as many soft destruction tools. Ten seconds left. Oh, I'm sorry about Five that, Light Rose. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I like I heard you coming in and out, and I was like, "Did you? Did, 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 did you good? We all good." Oh yeah, we are all good now. Setting up here, uh, that Maestro is always a really pivotal operator on third floor in Cafe, which is the overwhelmingly most popular objective throughout history on Cafe. And there's a lot of safe places for him to hide out, especially like the freezer or on uh, Cocktail Balcony, where if with just a little bit of support, it makes it really hard to frag him out or anything. Yeah, here he's got a hard floor to be standing on top of and keeping eyes on those cams, stopping drones from coming in through piano or Christmas room and as well as that, top of red stairs. So Ghost Killer does what Ghost Killer does best, and when they when they come from the bottom and just work their way up. The only problem is they might need a friendly face. Well, there's one less friendly okay. face. Boo on the white stairs gets taken out so quickly by Pancake. He gets not prepared for someone going near that white window, and already that leads NECC having one man advantage. All they have to do is really chip through this utility. Yeah, that there, Light Rose, is the power of drone assist. That your one up, your extra life, your wall hacks takes out Boot, the most pivotal operator on defense last map for UW Platteville. So that's a huge start for NEC, especially as they're climbing their way Device right in into the third floor. They've got top of red stairs opened up with that horror breach, the first big objective to deal with. Oh, and that is the worst operator to lose at this point as well. Brent goes down to play his safety there in the freezer. He's been rooted out. First operator killed for the defense is chosen. But Hatchet Thumb is there to find revenge for a teammate legally dead and bring them to clutch this up to keep them in the round. But there's a trade back and forth there. GK staying on top of the dead left. Entirely alone. He sees the head. The flick is almost there for him, but he's on a long range engagement. This is not to his favor. Deploys one smoke canister, but it's really not going to do much. There's NEC starting out with a very strong first round. Three left alive. And already, this could potentially lead to a much different cafe. But in that first map, we are very much back and forth. And I think it, it would be fair to expect something of the same here. I love to see that NEC coming out with the vengeance, really showing their comfortability on their own map pick here. They have to attack to start off with, but if it's going to be like that, I don't feel bad for them. 
at all for that fact. So that Attackers really big wall bend kill to start bomb. things off. Taking out a Maestro secondly and great coordination over on Christmas side, opening up the wall, dropping three players in and just rolling their way through anyone who works trying to peek them. Yeah, so I think uh, the first step, the, the, the first step, Boo doesn't die on, on white stairs. I think right there, Attack. already Double taken the care of. I wouldn't expect the same thing to happen to such a good player. Murray, potentially on the vigil, I think, trying to adapt to the amount of drones that NEC usually throws out when they're on the attack. I think that it could potentially be a good change, especially with Ghost Killer on the Yana. So a very small amount of changes could lead to a lot more beneficial round plays and eventually potentially a round win but once again going back to the the same site you, the odds are still against you because once again you did lose on this round this site once before yeah, and of course they're aware of this. They did hover first floor for a bit, uh, looking at kitchen for the first objective. No, no peeking through this wall. Oh, except now that it is. Okay, just taking it, uh, yeah, one shot at a time. If he doesn't see a thing immediately, it's not worth sticking around and risking a life for him. It was good to get boot first round, but if it's not going to happen, it's just not going to happen. Brestic playing his life a little fast and loose. They're taking some damage, and hopefully he won't meet a similar fate as before. Here back on Kim's feeding that intel to the team, and that's what they're really playing. It's an intel game with the Maestro and so much anti-drone utility. Yeah, of course. If you leave your drone in the wrong spot, Maestro can open his camera and shoot it right out. There is Murray taking out Ghost Killer, a huge part of last round and the ability to flank. But now Murray and his flanking could be a big factor on this one. But there goes Legally Dead. Your smoke is going to be the first one off the board. Bot takes a lot of HP in the process, but the fact that you've got your drones, you've got a smoke down, one of the most crucial operators on the defense already this attack is lending itself to great things i think the only thing left is the shield on pixel yeah that shield on pixel is going to be the big thing to deal with they're taking the same exact attack approach as they had before c4 might try and mess that up it's just not lobbed far enough it's not going to find any damage even as hm3 tries to peek through this little tiny glass pane that he's got a little bit of bulletproof glass through his shield Windows trying to work position. with another shield going up in the other window there's so much vision all the way through christmas right now a huge sink for nec they really are counting on this to pay off but Murray, they have to be aware of Murray. And they had drones over in Cave, but that's not really going to cover where this Vigil is. The Nomad is in play. They still have one air jab in their pocket, and I think Murray knows that an air jab has to be around these red stairs. We see one player still left in Pixel, actually retreating off of it with only 45 seconds, losing another player. Your Maestro is going to hurt a lot more, but Boo and Murray swing back a lot harder, taking out one each. And now you just have two left in Cigar oh, huddling no. in the corner for survival. And this could be an ending right here. The refrag happens and in, with the swing for Murray as well. Seems third floor went a lot better the second time around for this Platteville squad. Oh, we just look at Boo and Murray acting in tandem. They both land a double kill that round and they do each kill simultaneously. It's like uh, if you ever play Splinter Cell, like two player, it gives the option to get like a... You mark and then execute. That's exactly what they were doing there. Swing in perfectly in time. And that's exactly what you want, especially with a good realm and pinch movement. So that is a huge testament to what they can do on the defense. And they earned their way back into even on round two here, saying, no, NEC, don't get to just walk all over us. Taking out Boo, that's a fluke right off the bat. He can put those kills up if he's not getting wall banged in the first 30 <laughs> seconds of the round. So Kitchen is a much different beast than third floor there's is some similarities but i think some teams have the ability to hold upstairs with murray on the vigil that is what i am expecting from them hm3 bringing the castle this time maybe putting some on the double door putting some on prep door prep window where hm3 kind of wants to set up these castle barricades can really indicate what platteville wants to do with their actual defensive strategy 
attacker's objective is they're to keeping plenty of vision across they keep in the maestro in the playbook once again uh and the castle interestingly is a, a little bit of a sink uh bot though is just staying on that sledge just like he was on last map so i'm sure he's just gonna walk right through those as long as he's not an early early death for the team the attack is posturing right now around bakery right off the bat but i think that is bot actually running right over there towards the front door where the castle barricade went up funny enough <laughs> Um, but, yeah, working kind of from the, the top down. Sometimes you'll see that where teams will go for either a horizontal push or they'll actually go from top down. Here's the thing, though. Bot feels like the only person up on this third floor. I don't really like that because if they do drop this hatch, then Murray is absolutely right there and they will find the kill. I have no doubt in that. And I don't know if they actually were spotted out from the drone. Yeah, the thing with that is that normally that's not unreasonable to do and there could be a player down there looking for the kill and they would still get it just the same, but there's no one for a refrag. That's what's really important about having bot all on his own up there on a real real split push. He's probably going to be able to give more to the team on second floor rather than third floor anyways through knocking out the, the floors and giving some opportunities for like nades to be dropped below to open up the utility, take off the mute chambers from the walls and allow Pancake to do his job. Yeah, we're going to see that prep wall opened up, which should allow another access of entry. It allows line of sight. But there goes Murray, actually. It seemed that Bob was assisted by Ghost Killer. So now you have one less roamer off the bat. Hopefully, Boo will be able to pick up the slack. I think that is Boo over in Coach Check. It's actually HM3 with the UMP. The crouch I'm trying to just get the smallest of angles. They just missed for a little bit. If they don't find the kill onto ghost killer and that could be the worst and uh, worst has come treasure that uh, the the ump it's a fickle mistress and sometimes it will just not reward you with that kill the slow slow fire rate really really hurts but stick here low on health looking for some bullets to put through the bound of that barricade uh the flash grenade going through doesn't seem to have exploded in the Explosives are coming through. He doesn't see any feet to shoot at, and he's gonna lose his cover real quick. He has gotten his way over to his little bit cover right there. He's gonna be squaring up directly with that good shot. Okay, Ghost Killer does not have that line of sight yet. He's back on cams. So looks like legally dead is holding up in Bakery. Finds the kill with his FG11. Goes out for another, and he finds it. That's a double kill for him. He's gonna shift his focus once again towards GK where he knows his teammates are. And the bullets give him another one to look at. Oh, with Ghost Killer going down, Bot holds this angle, but they actually have to push forward. They don't have the Diffuser, and eventually they do take out Legally Dead. It's a 1v1. It's Boo versus Trojan, and Trojan doesn't know where Boo is. It's a ring around the Rosie. The bullets are going to fire, but just time is the enemy for NEC. Platt will come away with it, and that just felt like the biggest heist that we have seen all night. Absolutely. The defense just looking stellar in those final moments. Those SMG 11 kills huddled in the corner of kitchen prep. That is so darn scary of a position of being, but Legally Dead played it perfectly, keeping his head out of sight and absolutely on the minds of the attackers until he was dead, but perfectly setting up Boo to just hold up in that corner and chosen no intel Attack and one of the worst hip firing guns in the game can. to try and work with up close and personal. Good players can control that thing like it is Cali's sniper rifle. Sometimes all you need is just one headshot. And with a high fire rate, yeah, the recoil is going to kick like a mule. But sometimes it'll actually work in your favor and it'll zip itself up right up to somebody's head. But reading is going to be our tertiary site so far as Plantville can go back to bar. They can't go back to kitchen. So they have to go here. No castle though that's the one thing that is surprising so far they brought a castle previously but on a site like reading they're opting to not bring castle five seconds i'm curious to see what they'll do with it. having murray on the thunderbird i think it's kind of taking a similar role in enabling third four floor play because you can take a fight and you can drop back down into objective get healed up and send yourself right back out or otherwise just hold an angle on site that's kind of what the castle barricades would be doing giving you some more flexibility upstairs less lines of sight for the attackers to have immediately and to slow them down up there but they're not really playing upstairs super aggressively anyways three plays directly from the site and some light uh reinforcements up from the moon sea breadstick is going to be doing some playing upstairs Ghost Killer doing their old 
information gathering. They are going to spot somebody, and they just do not take any time to oh, hop on in. They did not spot the one, but they take out Murray, and that's a huge flaw. As now Platteville is without a roamer, and taking out Ghost Killer could have been a huge boon for NEC to deal with. As now the, the burden falls on Brett Essig, who shoots at Bot's kneecaps, but they actually can still walk around and they all walk away as Ghost Killer gets their second. And now third floor and potentially second floor could be clear for the taking if Ghost Killer wants to continue their reign going down these white stairs. Yeah, he's got to give away his location, though, when those smoke grenades are going to cover this up, making it hard to see and even harder to keep moving up. He's prepping a grenade, just hoping, just like he hopped into the building to find that first kill, that a grenade's just going to get lucky, find someone, and just allow him to keep up that reign of a terror. Page of three is playing safe, playing far behind, and he's got uh, an ADS, which is going to mean that no bit of that fragmentation is going to end up being a problem for him. The defense is now having to play pretty tight and close to the chest. They're down two players, and they see that shield coming up. The second smoke grenade is going to go out. Oh, and the smoke canisters actually do a lot of damage. Bot is going down by HM3. It, and this could be the start once again of Platinville just coming behind. Their roamers may not be doing the job, but their anchors will be. There goes HM3. And now it just relies on Legally Dead and Vu. There goes the last smoke canister for Legally Dead. A frag grenade just out of reach, but the SMG-11 isn't going to do the job there. Boo takes down one as Pancake finally is able to slap that diffuser down. Boo doesn't get any more done than that. And with NEC, we're back at a tied scoreline, and this map just seems to me a repeat of the last one. Back to back to back to back. When NEC turns it on, they really turn it on. Round one and four, just such dominant play. I mean, it's not like a flawless round or anything, but you could just see the confidence in their play, just running it down, especially GK. Uh, Ghost Killer really spelling the round out right there. He's going to die, but the 3K on the round and two of them in the first minute, that is just dominant play. Defenders, protect your bombs from being yeah, defused I mean, by attackers. I mean, this map... It doesn't feel like anybody really has a good grip on it. You could say the same about the previous one as well. I mean, Plantville came away with it due to uh, the ability to actually put together two rounds in a row there at the end. Is the same thing kind of going to happen here? Who's going to get the lead? Is NEC's defense going to be a lot better than their attack? Is the 43 scoreline kind of feels a little inevitable because of how the ability to trade rounds has just been so prolific? Wait. Left. Yeah. Is that a yeah. prolific? Yeah. Prolific. That's the, the one. Prolific. I was you ever just say a word and you're like, that doesn't oh, feel right. Shoot. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like a good one that like if you say it like twice, it's just not a word anymore. Maybe yeah, there, we'll come there back. There are definitely to words like that. Especially when you spe have to spell words and you're like, hmm. Like, you, when you know, like, a word is spelled right, but you're like, that just doesn't feel right. Oh. Like, just say, like, slime to yourself, like, 20 times, and then just yeah, like, see what slime is to you. <laughs> As you just, like, break your brain's ability to conceive of... It's uh, an odd... I, I, I guess I've never had... It's an odd example. I've never thought of the word slime. Like, like what is slime anyways, right? <laughs> just goopy stuff. Just goopy What's goop? Stuff? Two minutes and 15 seconds. The defense finally finishing their, their prep phase shenanigans. Bot actually on the Zofia. That might be the first time that we have seen Zofia oh. so far. Murray to their left. Trojan oh, catches no. the drone. I don't think the drone was heard. But looking at the last second, Murray gets taken out. And their roaming abilities have really not been as effective as we might have hoped. They've just been droned out. They've not found the kills that they needed. They dealt damage to Trojan. But not taking out the Nomad is huge. Who picks up the slack by taking out Ghost Killer? Uh, a huge player on this attacking side. But the fact that you still lost Murray, you have to put the pressure on the rest of your teammates, does hurt a little bit. Yeah, Ghost Killer is down as well. So these are two of the highest impact players in the lobby, gone and dusted. Legally Dead has a little bit of support to him. Oh, but he's going to be called out. That's from right behind him, but it's just not fast enough. He can't get that turn on Pancake. He finds another one bot as well. Now the drops are taking all their own move. And HM3. HM3 finds one, but he still only got that one compatriot. Once again, that's the Mark Cross Christmas the room. Boo finds a great angle. He's got two now for the round. He knows the location of that diffuser. He's got to look over here. Watch Shenko try. And find someone pushing up on that TPS. He does have the cam still. The Meister cam giving constant, constant pings that are probably going to go away with so few explosives for the attack. 
Uh, the only real option, Hatchet Thumb has a pocket EMP. They aren't close enough to probably melee it. So all they get is one impact EMP. Boo does a little bit of damage to Hatchet Thumb's feet. They're just the, the little holes in the talent shield. The yeah, but they can't finish the kill. And now it goes on to HM3 as Hatchet Thumb will start to put that diffuser down. The freezer seems to be the goal here. They actually find them, but the diffuser gets put down. And you can see the amount of HP on both sides. It's going to be one bullet. Who is going to peak first? HM3 has the SMG 11. Trojan is now on new hatch. HM3 is actually going to back up, go to Cigar potentially. The lack of information is just the biggest thing here. The Z-Ping might help, but the lack of real cameras is going to be the biggest thing here. The swing comes out, but Trojan is not around the corner. HM3 has to push up. There's about five seconds left before that diffuser goes off. The swing happens, but there is Trojan winning it out and ending get the lead for the first time since round one. You do love to see a Trozen Op keeps ending up in these 1v1 encounters and just being so close to that victory, but this time it's just a little bit more comfortable for him. He had more time to put that defuse down, but he nearly, nearly did it. I mean, we talked about, there was that one moment, uh, so much happened, the defuse finished, uh, our defender had the line of sight, Boo was firing at the defuser right as it ended, he doesn't quite find the kill, and an air jab goes off, it doesn't quite hit anybody, but it's going off, there's just so much simultaneously, and Boo still keeps Keeps a level head, finds a kill to bring up the 1v1 and nearly clutch it out. Now, uh, Murray had the uh, opportunity to kill Trojan early in that round. And uh, guess who won that 1v1? It was Trojan. Actually, interestingly enough, uh, you know that air jab that you mentioned? Do you know why it didn't do anything? No, I didn't catch where it was. So I believe it was by the freezer uh, rotate, but it did go off. But technically it was working as intended, but because HM3's uh, feet were not touching the ground, it did not have any effect. Oh, that's what it was. I, I did catch that he was vaulting through it, so I was wondering if yes. it had anything to do with it. But... Yeah, that's why uh, That's why you have to, Nomad air jabs aren't really going to have the biggest effect on, like, cafe third floor. Because even if you place it right outside the window, it will literally do nothing. That's why you have to place it where people will be standing right on the ground. It, it, it is a little information that sometimes people might not know about. So it's just, yeah. Especially when uh, windows are a very big part of a uh, map's geometry. Yeah, Cafe is one of the biggest. I mean, the biggest one in comp rotation right now since we took away Consulate, the, the king of all the maps window-wise. <laughs> but Cafe is so big. Oh, right thank now. God I mean, that's gone. Uh, if you look at, like, Christmas Room, where it's covered in them, and we keep seeing it used really well by NEC for their attack. Uh, just like they're really using uh, GK right there, finding kill after kill. Sit on 7-4 right now. I mean, this round is just opened up. HM3, they, they were alive last time and they had an opportunity to win the round, unfortunately, with Ghost Killer right there. That's a huge, uh, it's a huge blow to the defenses. You lose the mute, lose the C4, and like before, you just put a lot of pressure on everybody else. Trojan takes a lot of damage, not exactly where from, but I, I wouldn't say that Platteville are completely out of it. You've still got Murray on the flank. They're not taken out. They're not the first death like they have been in the previous three rounds. And so now you, you still definitely got a chance, but as long as Ghost Killer's alive, I think your odds are kind of in, in the lower numbers. Bakery wall is fully opened up here, so the anchors are having to keep their attention split at best, if not singularly focused on the attacks that could be coming in from prep and bakery. They got to keep behind cover, which Legally Dead was doing really well last time. It really shows that knowledge of this position specifically, and it's an important one to be on. Ghost Killer taken out here by Murray just on that flank, just hanging around this area until Ghost Killer has run his way down a, another undrone hallway, which is the one thing that's going to give him some pause, is that he's just not waiting for drones all of the time now you've got the ability to flank down the red hall murray gets their second gets their third and they've had a lackluster performance so far in this map it's immediately bolstered in this round they find three and an ace still on the horizon hash them in pancake inside of prep Brent gets taken out a 3v2 with Platteville having the advantage in their, their backs were in the corner it seems like they might not have a chance but they might not have another chance again as nec gets to a 
of their own. With 30 seconds left, they have to push up. Hatch them has to get this diffuser down, and it wouldn't surprise me if they actually start to diffuse right about now, and it's exactly what they'll do. Yeah, that shield is also going to add a lot. There's no explosives for the defenders to be yeah, used. Exactly. Murray dies with that uh, shield in the pocket as well. Diffuser is down, though. It's the 1v2. Who's going to have to push up across no, site, which is definitely not what he's ready to do. He doesn't have any explosives to work with, nothing to throw over there or any more intel to bring to the table. He just has to do it with the gun in his hands. And he hears that shield going up. He's going to have a little bit of an audio cue to be working on. But split attention just makes it so hard to win here. He's got to win a 1v1 and a 1v1 with someone else watching. And Hatch Man just cleans this one up after securing a block on the objective. Well, 4-2 is where we are after it is all said and done. Platteville now on the attack. They have to go through NEC's defensive abilities on Kitchen. Pancake is actually going to be going on the Bandit, and we're going to see a Nook being played by Boo. So... A lot of different operators than before, definitely. Murray, no surprise on the IQ. But, I mean, you know, IQ could be very strong on this map, especially if they have impact EMPs in the pocket. But Bandit, I think that's why Pancake might be on the Bandit, is just to try to trick him out. But you can't cover all the walls at the same time. So I think... We'll see what the plan is on NEC. Yeah, no mute either, so you do just have to choose four of your six walls to be dealing with here. And Hatch is going to be um, absolutely unprotected there since there's no Caillou to be dealing with. I think it's interesting to see Boo is actually the Nook player that we've been kind of posturing around with that ban in the first map. Uh, it plays like it from his defensive play. It honestly makes so much sense. Ten seconds to go. Boo sneakily getting in there and finding a kill really does kind of seem like their their style of play. Attackers are heading out. To uh, is that a patch of them that is still AFK? Who's AFK? Somebody. Oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> they they left the prep. It was hatch with them. They left the prep phase abilities to their to their friends. It's actually now the fact that they still have to deploy all their mines. They have to get this deployable shield down. If they don't go quickly, and if if it's kind of off site, then really the the potential is wasted on in hatch at them's pocket but the deployable shield still not deployed i think that that's the big play yeah that really stuck out to me at the end of last round it's different teams nec is defending now and platteville was before but platteville left a lot of utility in the pockets on a kitchen round which is just such a utility centric objective like that's what you're going there for is to make sure that those shields are going to stay up and give you so much time and i can't help but just think about that in the way that their last round on the defense goes. They have uh, to find some ground back on attack now since they've lost uh, that one like decider. So it's not a 3-3 split, it's that 2-4. And NEC, they just got to make the most of their defending rounds now. They're close to winning out this game and taking it to map 3. Surprisingly, nobody is really offside, especially Ghost Killer, who's hanging out by Bakery. So third floor is going to be clear for the tanking. Second floor seems like nobody is on it, and that's actually what it is. So they'll just get vertical play, honestly, for free. Breadstick on the buck. There isn't any breaching charges, but as long as Breadstick stays alive, that's really all you need. You need to make sure that you don't get taken out by your own vertical holes, but putting fear into the defense is honestly... There's so much value out of that here. But, but, oh no! Oh no, more Nook. Uh, a very, very how shotgunned did, there. I don't. How did that happen? That is actually really curious. There's, there's no, there's no soft floors over here. It wasn't through a wall or anything. Uh, I don't know. Like, I guess uh, I'll, I'll kind of camp for myself that it was like a cosmetic thing that they just noticed. I mean, I, I don't know. But yeah, other, other than that, it definitely does hurt them in this level of play because Boo is not only one of their leading fraggers, they've also got the frag grenades, they've got the FMG9. So I, I think now the vertical play is gonna have to get something done now that HM3 is gone. Diffuser's actually dropped with nobody to come pick it up. And with 30 seconds left, it is being gonna be watched like a hawk. 
Yeah, Platteville is worrying me here. I mean, Ghost Killer making these two standout kills just peeking something that you wouldn't expect. He knows he can do it with the timer. Being right here, and he's just going to shut down the round on his own if he can. So, very respectable right there. But just so little pressure from Platteville. It's like, it's as if they weren't even going towards the objective for the entire round. There we go. Ghost Killer shut down, but it's a 2v4 with seven seconds on the clock. The fuse has got to be going down right now, right now. And Pancake still here right around the corner. Or bot, uh, takes that kill, takes out legally dead. They don't even have to find the out of final time. attacker because no one gets to object. And the diffuser was still outside. So I think on Cafe, Platteville seemed a lot more uncoordinated than we might have seen before. So this attack could be a little discombobulated. They're going to be going to the third floor. I think they're getting a, a timeout. I don't know if NEC, I, uh -oh. I think, you know, we'll see if uh, NEC is going to get a pause. I don't know if they have the ability to so we'll see kind of what goes on maybe maybe that's why hatchet them was afk there just closing it okay well clearly he's just talking the game like problem solved yeah that is uh that is helpful i'm not sure if uh that pause is going to come out or that timeout uh well i mean definitely no pause happened so yeah well, the setup will continue as normally scheduled. Who wants to get on that nook? Hopefully not Bomb to be shotgunned away by a teammate again. That would be a real shame to see. Yeah, that, that would hurt a lot as... That is a... The, the, yeah, that is the Warden Elite. Ten okay. <laughs> I think because Bot, bot was... Better. Well, because uh, here's the thing. Bot was having... I believe Bot was having the Discord problems. So they didn't actually operate her. So they got auto-picked a Warden. Of which they had the elite. So. Yeah, that must that must be it. That's that's a shame not having that all prepped. They are down a player, so it's gonna get harder to get all the way up to this match point like they want. <laughs> Here's the thing, though, treasure that warden elite kind kind of fire though. Like tropi tro the, the tropical warden, the mustache, the, the hat. It's it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that drone's got to go, but sticking around with the shotgun, not even the Mossberg, is going to be a great move right there. Waiting for those audio yeah. cues. Uh, that's a friendly, though, moving on over, so okay, he's just going to keep holding up this angle, trying to find, like, a cheeky kill to start things off with. I need to go into his location, but he's not there anymore, so he was just waiting that out, waiting for some intel to work with. So, Platteville have to work off of the advantage that has been given to them. They gave one to NEC last time, who came away with the round win. Attackers Same thing the cannot happen. NEC cannot be allowed to win this one out. Ghost Killer takes a lot of chip damage, but they're still alive. And eventually, they kill Breadstick. And Boo could be the next casualty as the shotgun aims around the corner. Nope! The head is just presenting itself onto Boo's gun with a, a 4v3. Ghost Killer actually is going to be able to heal themselves up with those Thunderbird Kona stations. So the damage that was done to them will be absolutely negated. Yeah, these uh, mute chambers have been doing quite a number on the attack, making it hard for them to move on in. Trozen and GK, again, these in tandem, cleaning things up, making it a lot more doable uh, for themselves. But HM3 and Mary Dolphin here. Attackers recovered moving their the way from the site, keeping their eyes close. Yeah, with uh, Murray still alive, I think this definitely still has a chance, but Ghost Killer still here really does hurt your chances. They are such a good player, especially when they're given room to breathe. And I think that is something that Plantville hasn't had the ability to do. They haven't put the needed pressure to shut down Ghost Killer. So NEC could honestly put themselves up on map point, take us to a potential map three, and it would not be that surprising considering their four homes so far, but there goes Ghost Killer. HF3 is immediately refragged, and now it falls on to Murray. There was an automatic advantage to Platteville as Bot had to be team killed, but it seems that NEC just kind of shrugs it off and they might win the round anyway. Ooh, he's found at least one gun there across the map from him. He knows where the other one is. He's taking the shots a little bit before his opponent, but he's just not finding the head. That is tragic for him, especially as Troza has the opportunity to go and get a little bit more healing off of that Kona station. Hatchet Thumb still at full health as well. They have no need to peek now. It's all on Murray to get in. He has to find those kills. It's not going to get him down in this situation. Got blazed out. Oh, trying to go for that Shaiko. Uh, Plant and nobody he sees his head. They're just pre-firing this. They know that's where he's going to be, though. So Hatchet Thumb just needs to switch out the gun reload. Thank you. 
not to be done. <laughs> They're putting themselves on that point off of another round in a row. Yeah, so now <laughs> Platteville have not won a round since round three. It's been five round wins in a row. Still asking for that timeout. I don't. I think they are going to be giving it over right. to them. So we'll we'll see if the they can figure out that. I guess it's a it's a tech timeout. Now. So what? Uh, yeah. So we can talk I'll be about to kinda, that out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Platteville is in such a hole right now. Like you said, that's six rounds in a row. Wait. I can, it's five. No, no, it's definitely not six. Five, yeah. Five. Uh, five rounds in a row that I preemptively uh, kind of went in there. That's not right. But that is such a hole to be in. They're looking so uncomfortable attacking right now. I mean, one lost entirely at a time. No one making it to sight at all. Like, if you still have an attacker up at the end of the round, like, that, that's really going to be telling you something is just wrong there. They just look really uncomfortable on this map. I assume that NEC just has uh, this practice, obviously it being their first pick, and that Platteville just doesn't practice on this one. It's, and it's a weird one. So not having this one practiced up is going to put you in a rough spot. Their defense was looking quite fine. Like 2-4, that's not a bad split at all. But on the attack, I think the cracks are starting to show. All right. Well, we're trying to figure out how we can... Uh what to do here with the with the discord we might figure out kind of if they could talk and give that's my advice personally is i think yeah. they should just say hey talk in game it's an option given to you as once again uh it is me alone and with my video ness and treasure uh, with his picture ness but yes we are oh, oh no he's back i'm back oh my goodness pictures there resolved he is. for now at the very least yes <laughs> but yeah like Plyfield does have that buffer they've won first map and they won it uh pretty convincingly there on chalet mm -hmm. so i think right now with this match point and a five two or six two split this is looking like hugely advantageous for new england colin and i think that makes us look forward to that border map and I mean, like, not to count anything before it is fully in the bag, but the odds, it has to be a miracle run from Platteville. Yeah. I think the Platteville's attacks have been really lackluster. The defenses have been the only thing keeping them above water, and they were only able to get two. But it felt like I, the 3-3 three, three should have been kind of the equal standing from them but just the fact that they haven't been able to really scrape together any attacking rounds i think uh they've gotten close a lot of times it's been one round two rounds two rounds or players excuse me but you know this last round platteville's gonna have to come up with something here otherwise nec is gonna walk away with the second map victory and we're gonna be heading to the third map which is gonna be boring we're at a reading room here, so we've been here before. And um, again, since it's on this half, it did go in the way of NEC, so not going to be really uncomfortable going to this other side. They're keeping the feet holes available, that way they can really engage opponents between the two objectives and in the hallway uh, when we come down to those closing moments of the round. It's much better for the defender to hold the peak hole on the, the feet, because you can't be walking around, you have to be already prepped to have that low line of sight. It also makes it a little bit easier for throwing out like uh, throwables. Now they don't have any smokes this round, so those aren't really going to come to the equation. But Trozen, once again on the Thunderbird, again, it's for that vertical play. Now the Buck is a very important operator. Then honestly, Breadstick hasn't had the best record in staying alive in important scenarios but they need to and they they did previously on the i believe when we're back all the way over to kitchen because you need to just create destruction especially on the reading side you need to flush the defenders out force them in a lot of unfavorable positions because if you kind of push them out of reading they don't have a lot of good areas to actually go into so Buck is uh, going to be the eyes that I, the, 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 actually the operator, excuse me, that I'm going to be watching in this round, especially with a Boo. That's another player that I want to see him actually get some impact on the Nook. Oh my. Yeah, he's going to have to do uh, a lot to really even up that intelligence game right now. 
uh, not like smart wise intelligence, but like intel. Uh, because there's five drones gone for the attack already. That's pretty rough, especially. Uh, well, it's a little better here with Murray finding the first kill, but there's just so many more eyes for the defenders than the attackers right now with losing so many drones through prep phase. Only two starting drones being kept up. Well, there's the second one as Platteville is trying to start the road to the comeback. They have to get four rounds to take us into overtime, in which they would also have to win overtime as Trojan is going to get down. Confirm isn't there, and I don't know if they will be, but for now it is a 2v5 with the only player taking damage so far is Murray, and they do not see, seem unabashed about that, continuing to go around the map, trying to regain the franking power that they once had. Well, there's the first, or uh, another one for the attackers. Uh, Trojan going down this time, finally bleeding out. Uh, Pancake and Hatchet don't have to hold down all by themselves. Uh, I think the team may have gotten a little bit uh, ambitious, a little bit bold off the back of those last victories. Uh, they led themselves to be in spots that could be easily picked off pretty immediately. And Platteville, while not having uh, super confident attacks on this map specifically, I mean, they know ahead when they see it. Trying to just find an angle is breadstick. We've still got Hatch of Thumb and Pancake. We're inside of Renew. We actually only Hatch of Thumb left inside of that reading area. The drone does spot them. So a flawless on the horizon. Fryer Grenade goes on through and forces Hatch of Thumb to actually rotate out as they have the super shorty equipped. They do not actually end the flawless round and actually get shot at as the diffuser starts to go down. You can just see the panic in Hatch of Thumb's area. They have just spraying all around, oh. hoping to find at least one kill. But there's so many bullets, so many sounds everywhere that it is a flawless eventually as Platteville gets their first attacking round. Well, it's got to start somewhere for them and a flawless is absolutely the place to be. That's going to bring up that morale a little bit. There's not going to be the doom and gloom that we're bearing looking down the barrel of the match point but it does still loom the defense is uh moving it back on downstairs is their first objective after all their most preferred of the three that they're running today downstairs in kitchen they've got the thunderbird once again i think for every round and a cap can even i think that makes a lot of sense given those time problems that platville's been having Defenders yep. protected it, uh, forces them by in a, but between a rock and a hard place it's now going back dagger. to kitchen NEC, I feel like they, the odds have been in their favor so far, especially when it comes to the sites. They've just been so good on the defense with Platteville, only coming away with it right there on a less than favorable site for the defenders. And after a little bit of a break that, you know, was a technical break, but it's a break nonetheless. You can kind of talk it out with your teammates, hope things will go better in the next round because you've got that small amount of time to work with. That's really interesting right there. Hatchet Thumb, uh, I think, used an impact on Five Freezer Wall in order to, to make it a little faster for setup off-site. They're reinforcing over it, uh, which, you know, in a lot of situations won't hurt you at all, but Hatchet now has zero impact, so that's going to be a little bit more problem if he's roaming and needs to get through a Claymore left by the attackers, or if he just needs to kill someone off who's on, like, one or a couple HP around a corner or even downed. So... That's one of those things where you're kind of taking a dice roll every time. I even better to have bot throwing that initial impact to open up freezer. Now, a different set of operators this time for Platteville, but with NEC kind of bringing a little bit of different cards to the table, maybe it's a little game of rock, paper, scissors. You don't usually think that Ying counters Capcan, but. I mean, you never know. Uh, you, if you run, if you flashbang the Capcan trap, it actually doesn't work. You should try this in wait, your ranked game. Wait a second. Wait a second. I, I've, I've got, I've got, I've got few enough MMR. I don't need to be sparing anymore for this kind of shenanigans, Lyros. I look. You, you don't know if you don't try it. <laughs> I, that's what I think you should it's like at least do. Try it. Oh, there's some uh, ambitious plays here once again from the attack. Murray and Boo hopping right on it. Actually, I think they've had enough time to uh, drone this out. I think get to tell for sure. But they've got command and control of the top floor already. There is no one to contest it. Well, it's going out through fireplace right there, making sure there's not going to be anyone to give Boo any problems. He's got a drone to doubly confirm the hatch there into freezer. is going to be exposed for them as well. So, so still taking the time to drone out, but you mentioned all the way back that 
Capcan is going to get a lot stronger when that timer is going to go against these attackers. And with Platteville still taking their sweet time, not really having the ability to take out these Capcan traps, I think that is definitely going to be true. Boo going down these white stairs, drawing it out, making sure that it's actually clear for the taking because I fine, you stand corrected. I think there is somebody in that Christmas area. So he's actually going to throw down a Candela and is welcomed for it with a C4. Okay, well, Freezer is now a dangerous area. Attackers could be dropping there at any time, but Tristan has made his way on out of their gun and killed to boot for it. And Boo uh, is going to be removed from the other side. So that's a little bit more of that split pressure going down the drain for the attack. NEC still staying strong with five players up on the board. They just have to find these. Oh, he doesn't know. He doesn't know. He just tapped on Hatchet Thumb and Hatchet turns around, kills someone else entirely. Uh, legally dead, unsure what has just back on drop the bomb. Diffuser. Well, a flawless could be answered with another flawless. It's only Murray all the way back in White Snares. Ten seconds remaining, Attackers but it's not going to be a flawless. They end up with a kill ago. onto their nemesis, Ghost Killer, but is immediately refrained by Pancake. And a third map we are headed to with NEC winning out Cafe. So Border is going to be our final play of the night, Trish. Yep, looks like we are getting to go all of the way. UW Plotville looked really strong on the first map, the one that they won on Shelly, but it was really back and forth throughout it, like you were saying. Yeah. They won because they really stringed together a couple rounds back to back. New England College, though, oh, they just took away Cafe. Yeah, absolutely. They felt confident on it, and now we can really see why that they chose Cafe to go to out of all the maps remaining in the pool. But that is going to be this second map. We got one more to go. We're going to pop it to a quick break, give ourselves a little time, give the players a little time. We will be back very shortly. Don't go away.
All right, welcome back to NECC Week 3, the Emergence Division. This is Map 3, the final map between University of wisconsin Platteville and New England College Esports. We are on the border for our final showdown. And so far, it has been a little bit back and forth, but NEC just really came out strong in that second map and absolutely wiped the floor with Platteville. Yeah, momentum-wise, that's definitely going to be a consideration going into this there on the high of that that last map. Platteville, I don't think they're feeling too good off of it, uh, especially after having to just duke it out in round one to find their first map. So they really have some uphill climbing to do right here. Some pretty reasonable bands to start off from the attacker, Stature and Jackal. We are so, so used to seeing that. <sighs> Yeah, those have been the standard attacking bands so far. No matter what map we've been on, it's always been Thatcher and Jackal. Now, for the defensive bands, it's varied a little bit. But with NEC going for Kite, that is definitely not a surprise. But I think this final defensive band, Amira or Valkyrie, could be a little different. I would expect a Valkyrie to be taken out as Mira doesn't get as much play on board. But you never know what Platteville is going to bring out. Yeah, I like that a lot. Banning out the Valkyrie is really big, but we haven't really, uh, she hasn't, well, she was, she was banned on last map, right? Was she on the first as well? No, she could have made an appearance on Chalet. That's actually kind of surprising in retrospect. Yeah, and, uh, right now, Valkyrie is going to be in play. Like, I can pretty much guarantee... Yes, yeah, that uh, Mira, you have to kind of force her in certain scenarios, but Valkyrie in almost any site can get play. And especially on border where it's sometimes a little bit more difficult to spot her cameras. The fact that Plantville is bringing her out is absolutely no surprise. Yep. Yeah, and uh, with a lot of soft floors exactly. here as the well, these are all very bomb. vertical maps that have been chosen. That's absolutely like the vibe for our map pool today between these two so uh valkyrie gets a lot of presence there i mean she's got the c4 from below obviously just shooting at feet from below can do quite a bit and they've got a composition that's really good attackers have located a, bomb. Have a lot of warm capabilities as well yeah the, the defense from platteville needs to be a little bit more stellar i, I think a 3-3 three, three, is okay but when it comes to confidence when you swap to the attacking side it isn't going to be the best thing. so i think a 4-2 for platteville is going to be the best thing so far other than that the nec when they go on their defensive side i think are going to have a little bit of an advantage because i think their platteville's attacks are just nowhere near as strong as the defense uh, I'm going to get on these drone counts again. That's three drones lost for NEC in that opening phase. That, that speaks to just uh, losing them for things that they don't necessarily need. You need to confirm on the point that we know what you're going to be attacking for sure. And you can lock in operators to make sure that you're ready for it. You, know, you suspect already what they might be doing. Oh man, three down and one is actually mute and tramped out right outside the door right now. So there's only one of these initial five drones still out in front of them. You just got to be more careful with those even if it's leaving them outside the building. Like knowing the locations of players doesn't do much for you in prep phase. It's only good until for about 20 seconds at the prep phase. Being 30 is, or, sorry. <laughs> uh, that won't, not 30 seconds, but uh, that might do much for you. But already down, he's really far away from the rest of his team, too. So that might be uh, a, a bleed out this way, unless someone's able to find a quick avenue to him. Yeah, I think there is Ghost Killer able to revive Bot, who now can fire right back. And I think the most important thing still has those frag grenades in their pocket. That is the, the most important thing that they have. And right now for Boo, they definitely took a little bit of chip damage fighting against Bond. But I think the most important thing for them, they can still fire their guns. So a lot of opportunities for both of these squads. But most importantly, a lot of things that can go wrong. I guess that's not exactly important, but it's a thing that you really need to be careful here. Ooh, there's the first kill fully coming out. Ghost Killer with the other frags on the team finds one. Another one for Trozen. They are taking the storm right here. They have Armory opened up. The smokes are the only things keeping players outside of Armory objective, especially with HM3 having his head taken off. Is Boo and Murray trying to hold down the fort while that last smoke just uh, withers its way away. One last player left Attack, as the exactly. roster has also withered its way away. Well, there is NECC able to put that diffuser down and able to very handily win their first attacking round. 
So if Platteville not going very well on Armory, it seems that their standard would be to actually try the same site again. That's exactly what they're going to do. They're still going to probably bring similar operators. Redstick on the Wamai this time. That is something of a of a different change. But NEC seem to really keep or actually be in the driver's seat for their attacking side on Armory. And that, I don't know if that's going to change even with operator differences. Yeah, they open up the wall so darn quickly. Well, am I going to potentially Attackers slow that down? Uh, potentially also slow down the frag grenades. I mean, they saw a death to a frag really right off the bat right there. But NEC kind of walks their way into the map and just... Uh, they didn't really take no for an answer on any gunfights or even just fighting on utility. Attackers so, uh, I'm not sure if Platteville wasn't playing really directly on their shields or hard cover very well. But that's kind of a similar result, so I might be suspecting that. Yeah, bot on the ying instead of the sludge. Actually, a very, very different change. I think it comes with a very different play style as well. I wonder what they're kind of bringing to the table this time. Maybe a they're not as confident in their ability just to take these angles, so they, they want to make sure that their opponents can't see when firing from them. Who knows what the change from the sludge is, but like I said, a very big change. Yeah, it's pretty pretty neat to see. Uh, there's no there's no castle, and this isn't really an objective that castle is going to be taken on anyway. So uh, that might be part of that logic behind. There's less value to be really getting. Once again, uh, Ghost Killer taking that spot that he wanted to be on before. Uh, he doesn't have to go for the res this time. So getting right up on the window. Aveza C4, he heard it rip quite a bit for him, and now he's got that spot. Upside down repel gives a much better angle than the right side up player down below. It's easier to see his feet before you can see anything. And the wall has opened up. Yet again, those new jammers not offering a lot of protection. Ooh, Legally Dead is downed. The frag grenade should actually be thrown out. I don't know why Wait, that, that the sound station... It didn't have to res him. Yeah. Had... Hmm. <clears throat> Uh, you might be able to wait for another one of those little gumballs to pop itself up in the Kona Station for the res. You might just be stuck there for uh, a bit. No, he, his timer. Oh, it's going to be a race. It's going to be a race, those two little timer circles. But elsewhere, Breadstick finds a kill on Trozen, uh, one of the big players from the last round, finding two before and none on this round. Hatch still is over here staring down that wall that Weekly Dead has been down behind. Uh, the timer is getting thinner and thinner. It's legally dead. There it is. He is going to be able to revive. There it is. The Kona Station. One. And they actually get it popped up with another Kona Station. So it seems that they are going to be able to help their team out this time. Hatch a thumb and pancake in that 4v2 as Platteville going back to the same site. It's always a risk for this team. But in this scenario, seems to be victorious as long as Hatch a thumb and pancake don't run away with this in the next 60 seconds. Funny enough, I think it's better for Legally Dead that he res rest at that time. There's no chance of him accidentally getting his head popped off during that time. He was to safe behind cover, and he threw out the grenade at the perfect time as soon as he got up to actually stop and attack. And he finds a headshot here. It is going to be the best timeline for him. He gets the second burst of health to boot, so he's feeling pretty lively here. Pancake is pushing up on the other objective. He's got a 3k on the round. Make that a 4k as he takes out HM3. He's only Legally Dead. He's not quite Legally Dead trying to stop this ace from going through for Pancake, who is on a crazy roll run. Right now, Legally Dead has just the SMG-11 to be working with, but he's got a nice, slick angle here. And he's trying to use sound to his position, force Legally Dead to come out of his hiding spot. Is now Diffuser's halfway through. Pancake is actually Attack going to stick on it, and Legally Dead doesn't know, but they do the get the kill. Down. Pancake Defenders had just on one Attackers second to really to, to figure it on out. Unfortunately, it just wasn't... Defenders disabled okay. the Diffuser. well... That 4K <laughs> down the drain. With the defuse as well, that is such a high cost for Pancake on the round. But Legally Dead, our, our intrepid hero, down but not out. Absolutely not Legally Dead for that round. I thought it was like turning to like Pancake's <laughs> dead body. was like, look at what you gave up. You could have won <laughs> this round, but... Uh, right now, one to one. So, so far, I mean, if we go back to last map, the two rounds that Platteville won were the second and the third map. Any any siege is won almost every single round after Defenders that minus one. So, the beginning of the map has always been a little bit 
treacherous for both of these teams. We're switching up the objective here. Flyville has one. Their second floor, so they gotta switch the things up to the bathroom. The other really, uh, the consensus is the other really strong objective on this map since the rework. There's a lot to work with. The bathroom is so hard to get through. It's uh, It takes until late round until you're able to get into workshop and actually open up the wall into bathroom between and workshop. And with that being a triple wall and that new wall that was added by the shower stretching to the window that also makes it really easy to stay there anchor up use someone uh late to the game holding up cameras or smoke grenades and they're bringing the goyo as well like some interesting placements yeah i mean the goyo putting on the hatch it's just a time waster that you have to pop the go you have to wait i believe it's the 20 seconds just for it to go away so the longer that teams actually wait to engage with the hatch the more that goyo canister is actually going to find value interesting play nomad trying to put a breaching charge on the window it's actually going to be jammed due to the mute jammer i don't know exactly what the the goal of that was maybe just trying to get the, the window open from the time being as murray is going to be spotted inside of workshop they actually are going to back up behind pallets as nec seem to be coming from this northwestern side oh that is five players you count one two three four five orange outlines right there the other breaching charge is making its position known right there a little bit of cover still hides up that player in workshop nobody knows how many could be coming in through server gk finds the kill on murray i think might have been evidence that there's more players to be dealing with over here we got an interesting little roam out here from hm3 he's holding up an angle that could actually shut down players moving in through workshop into the hallway oh Oh, well, Murray gone and now with NEC trying to, to push forward. I think that the one player who's hanging right outside of the entryway, that bathroom is a, the one-stop shop for potential death if HM3 is not prepared for it. Actually, I think that's legally dead who's hiding inside the bathroom. And now that wall isn't actually going to be directly into bathroom. It's actually going to be good enough. I think it provides just one angle inside of it. It's legally dead is more than enough for legally dead to actually get a kill onto Pancake and give Platteville at least the equalizer in terms of man count. As HM3 isn't actually even going to fire at hatch at them, actually giving them the kill. Another C4 dropped here into that same vicinity as the last one. Also, going to find his mark and it is going to give away the location of the player. Upstairs, he's going to have to rotate off to try and find a flank right now. Make that hammer to the chisel that illegally dead is down here in objective. He's got plenty of health to be keeping this up. He's got still two more uh, smoke grenades. Prestek has made his way over there on the flank. Took out Bob before he's able to find any impact on this round or even the game so far. Prestek hits another one here. Takes out Hatchet Thumb and GK is the only one left out with this liver of health. There we go. Prestek and Boo clean up. Last two. Well, getting the advantage is such an important thing with Platteville. Important thing, and at least that for Platteville, is actually holding on to it. It's something that they've struggled to do so far in these three maps is anytime they've gotten the lead, NEC has immediately come swinging back. And a lot of that could be attributed to, I think, the tertiary site. That Platteville can't win three in a row because the tertiary side is a lot harder for them to win because they're not prepared for it. But I mean, you know, that's a just some analysis Attack on my side. Yeah, we get to test them on again can. here. Ventilation and workshop is their third objective. Uh, they did have a good job, uh, a good time of playing in this area of the map just a moment ago, though, since bathroom and tellers are Attack kind of adjacent here. The same wall is going to be a pivotal one once again into bathroom but there's a rotate hold this time that way some uh some close anchor some uh roaming can be done right there the castle is making that reappearance and bot still is off the sledge but i guess it's true the other is taking up that mantle that's actually a switch between the two 10 seconds to insertion definitely for sure but i think it will tell us workshops we don't i think tellers workshops a lot of time isn't actually gone for because you don't see many back-to-back -back defensive wins on board it's a little hard to go straight from armory straight to bathroom and straight to workshop when all of those three because border is a difficult map i feel that a lot of teams don't have a true grasp on it and either the defense or the attack inside wherever you are it's always just kind of playing a little loosey-goosey but oh there goes ghost killer they have just they are just so forward with how they play already yeah. in the hallway. 
I was curious to see Murray playing a little more passive. He died because he was pinging instead of shooting while he had the head right there on his screen. So he's just looking to ping that out. And the thing is, with the entry figure being uh, Ghost Killer, who will not wait for a moment. As soon as he's going, and he's going in full force. You, you cannot hesitate like that, especially when we're talking entry against NEC right now. And that's like that first step in this domino effect. Two kills and a lot of HP down from HM3. And oh my god, Ghost Killer's already looking right into sight. Barely missed the head on the second shot. The recoil just barely gets the best one on the G36C, throwing a frag grenade in. The ADS is going to stop that, though. Maybe not the second one, though. It's going to find his mark, at least knocking illegally dead out of his location. He doesn't realize how much damage he's done. Otherwise, he'd be wall banging all the way through this. Instead, he's just going to be waiting for the illegally dead to move. Just yeah, a moment. There, okay. there we go. That's exactly what he wants. But someone else comes right back around. It's Boo who gets the kill taken down. Ghost killer, but there's another player right back out there on that same barbed wire. Oh, there's no hope for Boo. They get actually find one almost close to getting a second there but NECC wins the tertiary site and now have to potentially go back over to armory win that and continue their streak of just one round win for NEC two for Platteville one for NECC or excuse me NEC or two for NEC and just a lot of these maps are so similar in how they play it's just these slight variations can lead to really really different endings yeah, you said it's been hard for Platteville to string together round wins. They have not gotten three rounds in a row in this entire series. It's either one or two in a row. So we're back to this 2-2. Two, two. It's the same kind of start I think we've seen Attackers for... To locate and oh, not bomb. quite every map. The first map was a back and forth for the first four, but these other two, one team was the first, the other one wins two in a row, and then someone evens it up. But like you said, war has that effect anyways. Warden this time being brought on breadstick. I think that is definitely the counter to the ying of hopefully which not bot is not this time. Yeah, hopefully not with an elite skin even though it's really cool and they should definitely allow it in competitive just because of how cool Warden looks but Warden is a counter to smokes to flashes and a hard counter to ying who is Five not being brought? Bot is actually on the Nomad this time, and I think that's the, the only Attackers flashes in play. No, uh, Pancake actually has those flashes, so Warden really isn't going to get too much usage, I believe. Uh, he's going with the C4 too, no uh, deployable shield. So the C4 is nice for the vertical play. There's three of them being brought by the defense. They already have a shield from Legally Dead, so not, not the worst thing to be seeing. He's picking forward the gun mostly at this point if there's no smoke coming. So that's what he's going to need to be making work for him. He's taking a lot of damage on this initial engagement, only found a bit of damage on Ghost Killer. But that's the most important player to be finding damage on. That way, if you can tag him out, you can make that win. And treating damage is always favorable when you've got Thunderbird, anyways. Yeah, of course. You know what I'd like to see with the usage of Osa in this match? Just how much Attackers willing to put their shields up on the windows. And unrelated to Osa, it's Boo finding Pancake. And now that takes out a Thermite. And I think that just throws a wrench in your entire attacking plans. There is no hard breach on the board anymore. Yeah, the craziest thing is that Pancake is the other operator right now, uh, Ghost Killer and himself being the only two with six kills, and Pancake's had more impactful kills to boot. He's torn apart uh, rounds on his own. The four to get that nearly ace, like, every time the camera's not on him, I swear he just starts popping off, and then as soon as we look to him, it is true. Like, the, the rounds is start getting true. set, but Pancake's been going crazy, too, despite having a support role. Oh, well, but it was just completely unaware of Murray, and I think Murray was definitely not aware of them, but there goes Vod. Redstick is trying to find an explosive kill just to make sure that NEC doesn't come away with the win. Unfortunately for them, there goes Ghost Killer getting their second of this round, and I think they are not going to stop at two. They are hungry for more in this round. It's crazy. He'll make off angles, just turn any mix and stand off into a kill for himself. Um, maybe stealing kills from his teammates a little bit, but he uses them perfectly for support. Uh, oh, those grenades coming to make it pretty scary for Boo, even though he's Jaeger. He doesn't have any ADSs to keep him up. Legally dead, now actually legally dead in the same position that he's played before. And Boo going down right after him. Again, no ADSs at hand over here. Perfectly cooked, taking out the Jaeger. Well, we have, we're getting close to that point where Platteville kind of either get to the, the apex of a 3-3 or once again, it's just NEC at a 
4-2, in which they have come away with the map win when they got there previously. And Armory Archives back there again. Platteville did the exact same thing. They won the exact same time that they went back here again. So Defenders, I just protect your I'm trying to like use attackers. patterns, but also be realistic about what ops they're bringing, how these teams are playing. It just these teams just throw statistics out of the water. Yeah, this Plato has a tendency to do this. This is not uh, statistically advantageous map for them. I mean, they're down uh, down one and two on this. So going back here again. They're, they're hoping to beat the odds. Uh, I guess technically Bathroom and Tellers should be the move. They're 1-0 on that objective. But a lot of this has come down to individual plays anyways. I mean, the real standouts right now, especially for this map, Pancake, uh, Ghost Killer, Boo, and Murr. Absolutely. I mean, look at the amount of kills that I think... You've got a decent spread on the side of Platteville. But I think that's only because they actually don't have that many kills in general. I mean, with NEC, you don't have a good spread, but that's because Ghost Killer and Pancake have eight kills and six kills. The most on Platteville is five, and then you got four, three. It's just... Platteville hasn't really been winning these straight off of kills. It's a lot of times I've been off of last second uh, defensive wins of when NEC has really fumbled on the attacking side when ghost killer is completely uh cameraed out and they do not know that uh Plattenville knows their exact position yeah although at this point he's kind of moved his way out of those cameras no one was in a position to punish that oh waiting for the audio cue though a c4 is gonna go down doesn't get any damage but everyone is well aware of the situation between the two of them now but that actually Seems like it opened up a little sight hole for Ghost Killer. He's just gonna peek anyways. He... Oh no! Oh. No! He finds two right there. The head just poking up right ahead of him, and even the player that was looking for him legally dead is two spooks by. Boo's gonna kill him though. Finally, put an end to all of that nonsense. But Murray can't take the fight against Pancake, who's been again on a roll. Boo's left all alone right now. He's got position right on sight. But with this, whoa, no, with the heart breaks going down and the stairs opened up by that C4 earlier from his own teammate, he's locked down in every direction. Uh, and I think uh, we've been looking to Boo to kind of be the counter for uh, Ghost Killer. And just apparently, Boo just cannot do the same amount when it comes to kills, when it comes to gun skill, because I think Platteville are just not ready for ghost killer they are preparing themselves they're allowing ghost killer to absolutely walk into sight find kills they're not ready for the aggressiveness i don't think that's going to end on the defensive side either so i think unless platteville deals with ghost killer they kill them early maybe many bombs they take can. them out get a refrag of sorts i don't think platteville are going to start to find any round wins or at least keep that to a minimum yeah, this is, might be their saving grace here. This is that 4-2 split again. It's nothing devastating. Obviously a disadvantage, but uh, you're only one off of that 3-3 split that you're looking for anyway. So that's that's just fine. The thing here, though, is that Ghost Killer can't choose his own battles now on defense. Once he chooses a position to be in, then the battles will come to him from the attackers, just mm. inherent mm -hmm. to the role. Uh, and that's where we've yeah, seen him really pop off searching. on attacking sides and a little less on defense. Luckily for NEC's Five morale, they get the attack first where they're looking really dominant. But this is the chance for Platteville to coast on up, to bomb. draft up behind them, and take advantage of the fact that Ghost Killer can't be everywhere at once now. Yeah, but I just, I don't feel great going back off of Cafe. I don't, yeah, I, translating to Border. It, it's a different type of map, but with Ghost Killer still here, they actually do spot the barricade. So I don't think uh, Ghost Killer is going to find the real kills that they wanted as the road bots them. And now they just have to flee for their life, going all the way over to customs, but not really retreating, just heading over to the window. No, oh, of course not. That's not what Ghost Killer does. Heading over to the window now, and I think could absolutely kill uh, Boo here. Oh. He's waiting for that opportunity. He might be going for it right now. But everyone has to spur, so nothing's going to come out of it either way. Unless we see people looking outside and then back inside at each other. It doesn't quite come out, but it could have been a 
a funny little yeah. situation there if they traded spots. Boo is closing up this ooh, the staircase avenue. So going through that hallway will actually get Ghost Killer killed. He's pushing up here, looking at the same angles. I think they might be staring right at each other through the wall. Oh, well, there it is. That's what I needed was Ghost Killer to get taken down, and that's exactly what Boo did. And now there's a lot less firepower for NEC to work with. Pancake has three less kills than Ghost Killer, but they are still really able to make magic work. So the, the hard job is taken care of, but now you actually have to finish the round, execute, win it through and through, and not give NEC a three round lead, giving them five rounds and putting them only two away from winning the entire thing tonight. Yeah, while we watched that whole epic go down on the stairs below, uh, Pancake actually was doing the Lord's work over there, bandit tricking just like we were saying. It's going to have to have a uh, comeback. So dealing with the Twitch drones, dealing with the, the frag grenades coming through, he's been able to keep the wall up. So Platteville is looking a little stunted against that. It's going to be up to their attackers that are moving up on these other angles to really make things count. That intel is really useful on the shotgun right around the corner, but Murray can't make it happen against Hatchet. Not so close with the Mothberg stare right down at him. Legally Dead is going to try and make this happen on Armory despite not getting the wall open. That's going to really be a tight pinch to work with, especially Pancake right here. The EMPs go off. He's going to make this attempt. Oh, and is it going to happen? I think he's going to back off at the last second, but Hatchet Thumb actually gets a second as Trojan gets traded out. The Bandit is still alive and potentially the only hope that NEC have, but as he gets taken out, Hatchet Thumb misses two. <laughs> They did some damage, but eventually gets breadstick. They reload the shotgun, but do they switch to the SMG-11? They're actually sticking onto the shotgun. The range, it's got a good range. It is not that good. How are they still sticking with the shotgun? No way, no way. How did they find the kill? How is there still a chance that they find this round win? And they could actually stick onto the diffuser. There is really no angle that HM3 can get. And honestly, this is now the range that the shotgun can be an effective play. They just don't have the time to bring out the shotgun. And honestly, I am just blown away at the fact that Hatchet Thumb actually got the opportunity to have that. Four kills. To 4 HP to rub between the two of these players, a Mossberg and an SMG-11, making that an alarming matchup to be going into for your attacker. HM3 takes it back. He goes right back in. He knows he's got it with that defuser outside of his own sight. That might be a bit of a blunder in the planting process there. He can't watch it from outdoors. But he saves that one from behind. Again, he only need one bullet to land, and he's a little quicker on it since uh, his opponent had to get off the defuser. But a hatchet thumb. 4K Mossberg, God, you gotta to respect and it. <laughs> I just, like, he missed, like, three shots and still got the kill on the one player into office. And just, I don't know. I think he could have absolutely won that 1v1 if potentially he didn't try to keep going off and on the diffuser. Maybe he just brought up the SMG-11. Once you got the player within, you know, SMG-11 distance, then you peek, get the kill, don't get taken aback by that thermite, but NEC going back to the same area, Ghost Killer, I think that that's the key to success, is just keep Ghost Killer alive, or at least waste a lot of time with Ghost Killer. Yeah, and I think something I do want to say for both these rosters, which uh, I imagine you'll probably be watching back on these VODs, if not just to look for clips, uh, to check for, you know, any readback stuff for uh, uh, learning purposes. Uh, I think uh, playing post defuse is where things are getting kind of dicey. I think that's our fifth 1v1 in this series. It's been a long series, so it makes a lot of sense. But some of these are coming down to these like coin flips when uh, there are things you can be doing to uh, like make this yours. It's like make them 70 30s instead, where it's just coming down to like maybe hip fire uh, ratios. That'd be the only thing that can actually make you lose that 1v1. I think we've done a, uh, at least a relatively good job of talking about those when they come up, but that might be a thing to look at for some easy improvement. Music. There's some music in that in that area. I was a little confused, but Hatchet Thumb trying to peek with the M870 and don't, doesn't actually find anybody there. But Ghost Killer, the the main man himself, gets one kill. And now with Murray gone, one in eight, having a little bit of a lackluster performance on this map so far. That means that there's one less person to try to take out the main man themselves. And 
Uh, hatch of them trying oh to make God. things work with a pistol. I mean, they have the M870. What else can they do here, Treasure? He's, he's really, really on shotgun hours here. I mean, uh, no, no, there. Well, I guess the impacts are available, but that's the only shotgun. Taking on some other operators that don't conventionally use it very often. I mean, uh, Hatchet them would otherwise have access to a uh, pretty long range, uh, accurate um, SMG. Right now, just some tit and tat fire going back and forth about halfway through the round and not a lot of progress for platteville in getting their way into sight so that time play thing might be a bit more of a problem with those thorn gadgets that hatchet them has brought i don't like the amount of time that is still on the clock with ghost killer gone because that leaves us just a lot with platteville to work with there's still four on each side, but Breadstick on such low HP. They really can't take any of these gunfights at face value. They're not going to be the ones to probably put the diffuser down, considering it is in HM3's pocket. But right now, NEC has a little bit of an advantage, but with Hatchet Thumb really only relegated to the pistol. That does make things a little bit more complicated. Shots coming around this corner. Someone's got to die on this one. round to progress at all. It's going to be HM3 not looking good for the attackers here as they're starting to stall out, especially pressing kind of such low health. Legally dead doesn't get the explosion he needs to take out the shield there. Some more gadgets to the Kiba going up to close up that window close things up once again for the defense. Boo is going to find a kill, though. Hatchet Thumb doesn't get to have any of those shotgun shenanigans this round. Chosen has to hold up close, just as Bot is going to be holding at the back. Angle, there we go! Shot in the back of the head, and one in the front of the face as well. Our last operator stuck in between his opponents, and Bot finds him from behind. Oh, there it is. NEC comes away with a victory on the second time that we had to Armory. So they've once again asserted a little bit of dominance over Platteville. Got an another lead over this team as Bathroom Tellers is where NEC's headed over to. Next, Platteville, I believe, got four rounds in the previous map. Three. No, this is, was the maximum amount of rounds that they had reached. So anything beyond this is doing much better than the previous map. But obviously, map Map one is what they're striving for, you know, a victory. Absolutely. I just, I can't, I can't shake the fact that it feels like every attacking round that we see lost from Platteville is not can. at the hands of NEC, but because of the timer much more. Because they just have to take fights that are essentially unwinnable, uh, pushing in where they have no intel, where there might be people watching, you know, 180 degree angles where you cannot contest like that final kill in that round. Uh, Platteville just has to, uh, it might be a direction thing in the middle of the round. Uh, uh, where they're not getting shots called a a as early as they need, or if they're waiting to really be aggressive until they've kind of locked down a ghost killer who's been their nemesis throughout the, uh, this entire match. You know, I like the cap can, I like the Valkyrie. There isn't any Goyo to waste time on the hatches, but, you know, I, I Fuse will substitute. It's a fun operator, definitely, to see, especially because he can just send Fuse charges through those hatches, which we don't usually see have a big impact now that we left that uh, utility era where you just throw so much into the site. He can still have a big impact considering we have Kona stations, ADSs, bandit batteries, captain traps. Fuse could really make his cluster charges work if he puts them in the right area. first explosion there going off right by that balcony where there's a fight going down breadstick finds the kill uh and murray goes down separately oh, well that was outside the balcony so probably avoidable if you're murray but for go we don't know where that one was headed out but that's definitely one that nec would really want back i'll take the refrag but like i said i think losing ghost killer compared to losing murray you lose a lot more if you were nec Looks has really shifted to be on these major fraggers. More of those shotguns coming out, and over drone here could be fatal because Bot is still just hanging on the same spot where he killed Murray. I, I feel like the drone saw him though. Like I feel like the drone saw Bot. Oh, right? It oh, definitely did. No, right? it didn't. They did not. He would not be looking there. He's just checking to be diligent. And there it is with the fire, anyways. I just, I, you saw the flick of the drone towards bot so that's why i felt like maybe they had saw him but regardless you still lose your valkyrie they are only halfway through the round and nec only have three members left alive hatchet doesn't have the cap can't see for they actually have the impact grenade so a lot of it 
I was going to say is on to Trojan, but that isn't actually going to be the case. There is no more plant now, really, anymore. So it's just going to be up to the guns of NEC, uh, guns of Hatchet, and guns of Pancake. With Hatchet could potentially find Legally Dead. They spot the gun barrel, and there it is. Legally Dead is down, making it a 3v2, as now the retreat into sight is going to happen. Trying to deter left with the, these hatches are really the only thing between Chaos and Order. Oh my, these defenders are just trying to hole up with whatever cover they can muster. Not too much of it has been taken away, but that shotgun's gonna start changing that quite a bit. First gunfight here going out in this last 2v3. Hatch takes quite a bit of damage, but he's got the heals to do it. Pancake, oh no, downed and out from that pistol from Boo. Silence SMG still not finding his mark through there, and Breadstick keeps the peak. Make sure he has a few bullets left in the magazine so he can just hold it after that first burst. Yep, one in the head. There it is. I mean, we've seen a lot more pistols than I really would have liked <laughs> this game. <laughs> oh, I mean, I mean, that's what happens when you bring a lot more shotguns, I guess. Yeah. Shotguns do not have the range that they do in real life. Otherwise, it would probably be absolutely busted. That'd be terrifying, especially one one shot headshot. You just look in their general direction. And it's yeah. Like I mean, it's got a it's got a large cone. All you need is one shrapnel, a buckshot. Just go. Boop. And suddenly, I mean, sometimes it feels like sometimes it feels like the Defenders Mossberg is like that. Sometimes where it is. I mean, we saw uh, the belief happen. I believe I think it was HM3 trying so hard to make the shotgun have the longest range imaginable. I mean, but we we see the limitations that the game is given it. Hey, sometimes sometimes you gotta play to your outs, and sometimes your out is like three pellets being really close together and killing someone at like 20 feet. And the, the Mossberg I mean, will do it. It'll do it. You just gotta believe. The SMG 11, though. Like, it's good. Oh, no, Use sure. the SMG 11. Attackers have discovered the location of a bomb. Five seconds to go. Okay, hatchet them once again on Thorn. This Attackers time back to the SMG has been bomb. enough shotgun time for him. And, uh, okay, with the uh, Frost on the board, they do have a, a pocket shotgun to play with the team this time. Yeah, uh, pocket shotty, very good. I think not having hatch at them, bring the M870. Much better decision, in my opinion. But something actually noticing is bot and hatch at them. Wait, what is... Okay, I was confused. I thought it was an armory play, so I was like, why are they hanging out in bathroom? But, yeah, but all three of them just kind of being in bathroom feels a little uncoordinated. Yeah, it's very centralized. I don't know if I like it, but it seems that they've kind of spread out. We saw the deployable, uh, the deployable shield get put down, and Bot is punished for their overaggression, their carelessness. Yeah, he's moving around a little bit too late into the round there. He didn't really have too much reason, no, like no aggression on him yet. Uh, nowhere really better to be, unfortunately, so... You're getting down to the bottom of regulation rounds in the map. You really don't have the room to be making those mistakes as you may have in like round one and two or three. At this point, it's starting to get pretty tight, especially with these fuse charges. Starting to blast their oh. way down to site, taking out your teammate, hatchet them, and all of a sudden, Flyville is looking very good in this round. Uh, usually, we don't see cluster charge kills, but hatchet them just was not prepared for the onslaught coming their way so now you've got three members of nec decently spread out you're not gonna see a honestly a, a refried really come through the way they are spread out ghost killer though gets one and looking for more but they're not looking in the right area trying to find potentially a claymore potentially a drone as there goes murray gets the kill and just avenges their fallen comrade the ace and honestly you haven't even lost much with the dedicated hard breach gone as breadstick is gonna stick down that diffuser he even 60 seconds still left in the round and now only about 40 with the train happening between them and honestly just a couple seconds with Cladville tying this up and we are going to see the maximum amount of regulation 12 rounds i like this play from Plaville, they've really pulled things together. I don't know what the, the change is in these last couple rounds. That's two in a row right here for him. You're talking about the fuse being potentially really playmaking. And not only getting that one kill, I'm like, we'll take those when they happen. It's 
I mean, that's huge. That's more than you're expecting any gadget to do in a round just on its own. Uh, so you luck out, you get it. But the second one is what's really important because they had a drone down below in workshop that fed information to the Thunderbird's location and they can know for sure. That's where we put it. It either gets Attackers us a kill or it's forced Thunderbird the entirely out of sight. Can. And Trozen had to run out and there's two players off site. They have to make a retake and it's so hard to do when the diffuser is down. So just like a textbook plant by Flatville, like, really well done. So I think, I mean, do you think that over time Kana seems inevitable at this rate? Um, oh, for what we've been seeing, yeah. Attackers have discovered the location of a bomb. Yeah, I mean, but in, in, two rounds that just look so confident, like not just not just wins mm -hmm. in a row, insertion. like looking like a totally different team on those two rounds. Yeah, oh, they. Yeah, that is a big difference. Is a lot of times it's just are there, there's the some ball. inconsistencies between all of them so far. It's with uh, Platteville. Sometimes their attack is lackluster, but sometimes they're very strong. But I think once again, I think my analysis is right. Ghost Killer. Now, if you take out Ghost Killer, kind of seems to all fall in line. Yeah, he has been the linchpin in NEC I, on attack and defense. I said earlier that it was really on attack where he's really shining. Like, that's true, but he's doing so much for the team on defense as well. So, I mean, you, you play with what you got. Having Ghost Killer is better than having someone who uh, is not as strong as a, as a player individually as Ghost Killer. But that is something that's just got to be like a bit of a, a, something you're aware of moving into the future, the rest, like the second half of the season for NEC. Okay, Breadsticks, it's an interesting play, trying to, to root them out. I like it. It's very, very different. But there it is, Ghost Killer. They have just been hunted down ever since NEC kind of got a, a, a decent lead. Yeah, no, Ghost Killer has maybe gotten one or two. But otherwise, they have been just the opening death. They have been one of the first deaths for NEC, if not the opening. So uh, it's a good plan from Platteville taking out what seems to be honestly the man doing a little bit or not most of the work for NEC in most of these rounds that they've won. Well, I'm going to come back to that conversation point earlier about the Nook. Absolutely a bannable operator in these situations. He's done so much for Platteville, but the, the players who banned him in the first place in map one were Platteville, so that says a lot about how much they value that operator and especially Boo on him. He's gonna get knocked out here by Trozen. That's just a uh, full peak fight there that can go either way. But Breadstick and Legally Dead are the ones doing the real work here, leaving Hatchet them all alone. He's off site. He's got smoke placed in there, but it's not gonna be enough, especially with fire coming down and denying area for the other Attackers team. He can't get anywhere bomb. close. They know where he is now after that throw. Yeah, he's, honestly, Hatchet Thumb has no chance. The, the fire is eventually going to dissipate, but he's going to equip the SMG-11. I don't even think to, possibly any damage to that attacking side, but map in match point has been reached, and not by the team that we really thought it would. Platteville is knocking on the door of victory. All they have to do is beat NEC one more time. It's going to be going back to Armory Archives, and... I mean, this is it. This is for all the marbles. If Platteville wants to avoid overtime, end it right here. Here it is. Well, if I would have said there was anything that Platteville needed to win this, it would be win more than two rounds in a row. And for the first <laughs> time in this three-map series, we've got three in a row. Rounds 9, 10, 11 in the books, taking us all the way to this match point. Attackers need to so locate and defuse bombs. They just do it one more time. They seem to have NEC and, more importantly, uh, Ghost Killer is a number right now. Get him first pick three times in a row. He just doesn't have to play right now. Yeah, I mean, it's the best thing. If you are Platteville, Platteville fan, uh, if Ghost Killer does not get to play, then I think that's the, the best possible scenario you can have. I want to know if they're kind of going to change their approach, considering how much they have been denied in these previous couple rounds. It honestly wouldn't surprise me if they don't just kind of keep trying to force something and maybe something will stick. But uh, yeah, so far, as long as Boo maybe guns for Ghost Killer, gets an opening pick, something of the sort, Platteville can walk away without even trying to enter overtime. Yep, 
here. Here's a little bit more of a split spawn from Platteville. Usually they're spawning all on the same side going in together, but two out there on the west side at different spawn points with the rest over towards the northeast. Um, it looks like some rotation has to happen right off the bat, though, so that might be uh, a little bit of error from them in the spawns anyways. Uh, Murray going in right immediately, looking to open up that door, trying to find out if anyone's over there by server room, and legally dead takes some damage, I'm not quite sure what, bro. Oh, the sneakiness of Boo has been a big impact on why they've actually been able to get some of these kills. They've utilized that uh, HEL gadget very well and just kind of schmoving their way closer and closer to site. Taking one of these NEC players by surprise is possibly the best thing you can do. Brustic is going to try something similar with that crossbow. Just root out one player in that half wall area, whether it is ghost killer whether it is somebody else then that seems to be effective but they need to be very very careful of the jaeger who has a position but do they have the angle they know exactly i feel like it's an error right now and there, there we go okay. yeah eventually just gets the better angle brestic stuck around there for too long to trust that fire that was gonna be the one thing that was the trump card uh, against ghost killer through the floor who actually is playing on site this time he wants to make sure that he's not the opening Pick, even if he's taking some fights through the ground. So finding the first pick for his team once again, he's back on that pacing that he really likes. But now you've got one player down who, I mean, we talk about Boo a lot, but look at Breadstick, 12 and eight. They were, they were definitely putting some kills up on the scoreboard. But somebody else is gonna have to do the work legally dead, just find so many shots into that locker area. And I don't even believe, they didn't find a single bullet onto one player. So Platteville is looking a little dicey as we get to 50 seconds left. They have to get one entry kill just to allow some kind of execution to happen. That could be the one that they need. It's three members inside one by fountain or that office area. And uh, at this point, we are starting to reach ahead with Platteville. All they need is one round one to come out on top, or if NEC wins, we go to overtime. I think Platteville is starting to fall apart here. They've turned that second floor uh, into a shooting range on that hallway. It's not going to be very advantageous for them. They just don't need the, the defenders just don't need to peek. But once they do, they do lose some kills here. Pancake kept the wall closed for plenty of time, but now he's stuck in the corner. Here's that repel. He's going to close up that gap there. No! Downing Boo and finding another two right here on the bridge. Reach. He's going to clutch that one out, keeping it going. I... I just... I'm speechless. Treasure. It was I, a 1v3. I, I mean, was technically it was like I a... we had 10 more seconds in that round. I was... They lined up. They lined up for each other. <sighs> Platteville had it right then and there, but we are going to be going at least two more rounds Platteville, they are going to be starting. If I, I did not see which one they were starting on, wasn't able to catch the name, but I want yeah, to. Wherever they start is very important. They're starting on the attacking side. They had, they got four on the attack. Do you believe in their ability to win on this attack, and then once they transfer on the defense to get one, or is it going to be an eight-seven back-to-back, a one-v-one uh, post-plant situation in that last final round? Yeah, I think we've got to a truly neutral map here. Both these teams got a 4-2 attacking split, so definitely preferring the attack. Platteville has the advantage uh, by the numbers to get to attack twice in a row, and they're still just blazing on with this momentum. Like, they didn't quite get that round, but it was almost by a fluke there, just uh, a miscalculation of putting two players right on top of each other, and really big plays from uh, that final defender to keep the everything together with that last spray from Pancake. Well, Ghost Killer, I mean, they stayed alive. That's They stayed alive decently long into the round. That's all I'm saying. Even though Pancake did come away with the clutch, it just, it was gifted to them on a silver platter. They did not have to move their crosshair. All they had to do was find one on Boo, swing back over to the breach, and just fire away. And there were the kills needed to win it out. But NEC going back over to Armory. They've got the Jaeger. They've got Bandit still, who's trying to trick slash just keep the, oh. this area secure. But no, that Bandit is gonna Buck is gonna make things a lot harder. No, Breadstick. That recoil do be hitting hard, Treasure.
Oh my god, just barely missing there. There's so many times where he traced over ahead, and even with such a high rate of fire weapon as his rifle there, he just could not quite land that. That's gonna be one of the unluckiest moments. He barely got any damage somehow, just one shot landing like on the feet of Ghost Killer, losing the breadstick. It was actually a really good play. Should have, <laughs> by all logic, seen great success with that, maybe even the 2k. But just all of that momentum gone to, especially this Ghost Killer heals up that last little tad of HP. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something that we've kind of seen, that sometimes the recoil is just a little bit harder to control for some of these players. Legally Dead, I don't really want to call them out, but yeah, the V308 with the suppressor, it's very, very bouncy. But, I mean, Murray, I think uh, we haven't really talked about them, but they have started to step up absolutely in these recent rounds, and they take out Ghost Killer. That's huge, and now that allows Platteville, the rest of them, to push on Bomb up. Located by that attack. means that the, the 90 is clear. Office is going to start to get pushed in. Security is free for the taking. All Platteville has to do is find some access into the site and just force their way in because now the key player is gone and you're starting to surround them, and that's going to really start to ensnare these defensive players. This round is looking really similar to last round, though. That hallway kind of turned into a bit of a shooting range. That's not going to get much for the attackers. They need to uh, actually spread out a little more here and find a second way to get in if the breach isn't going to get opened up just like last time. I mean, Pancake has been doing admirable, admirable work over there. Making Clyde do so much more work to actually get in. Those frag grenades are uh, trading with some impacts coming from across our C4. Breach gets opened and Bot is ready right there. He's not going to get what he wants. So HM3 is ready and just a bit faster, especially if who finds his kill. It's Pank again, Hatchet, Thumb against the world to keep up at this keep and count, trying to find their way ahead. Oh no, another trace and across the head and it doesn't work out for Hatchet, Five, Thumb five, either five. this time. Who is finished off by Pancake, keeping up that line of sight. Legally dead though, finds the kill. HM3 starting to play. Attackers are actually just right across the wall from each other. Hatchet, Thumb, up a kill, down a kill, and the plant's down. Round over. Oh, yeah, Platteville gets the attack. They keep that massive streak going. Uh, minus that, that last round, which should have been a victory for them. But now that they've swapped on the defense, it has been a long time since they have been on the defense. They've got to keep the charade going because they're one round away. They were one round away before, and they let it slip, but they're going back over to Armory. It seems that every single time we've gone to Armory, the defense has lost it, gone back there, won it. I think NEC was kind of the one to break them mold when they started to lose it multiple times. But before that, it was lose one, win one, lose one, win one. With Platteville going to Armory straight off the rip, do you think that we'll see that trend continue, that they'll lose it, we'll see NEC try again, and Platteville will succeed, or NEC will succeed, excuse me. Defender, uh, it's your it's anyone's game at this point. I don't, I don't know if uh, these stats are going to be doing anything for me where I feel confident saying either way at this point. I mean, it's been just slugfest through maps one and three. I mean, map two was the standout one in that New England College. Uh, looks so much more comfortable on it, but we're just back to the same pace of map one. It's whoever gets the round gets the round, and you know, it's not over till the fat lady sits. Bomb located by attackers. That is... Absolutely true. We've got at least uh, six, I think eight minutes if you count the, the prep phase and in between. We've got a good amount of time left. It has been a long night. It's been back and forth. It could be even longer, but we've got uh, another NECC game after this one. We start actually really, really close to this one as it's 9.50 and I believe the next game is slotted to start at 10. So, you know, you don't even have to wait long. If Exactly. It's ni nice and easy. Unfortunately, it's not going to be, it. at least me, I don't think Treasure, you'll be there either. I think it's uh, time to light somebody else, potentially. Oh, it won't be me, actually. We hopped on there. Oh, whoa, Breadstick sick, staying in there with just one little sliver of health. Uh, Ghost Killer taking some damage as well, but the Thunderbird had been so present for both teams on the defensive half. Going to be doing the work there, keeping Breadstick up. But that's so important at this rate. Like, every player counts for so much right now. Ghost Killer mm -hmm. getting... Oh my god, further than you would expect once again. The Bucks are also doing this job. They saw the success that it gave for Platteville, so now NEC is using it for themselves, making sure the half wall is not safe space to be. Ghost Killer, having infiltrated his way into sight, finds that kill. G36 CC and out. 
Oh, the whole floor has got to go. The whole floor. We don't need any. I'm just surprised that Bot wasn't shot at. It seemed that I think it was legally dead. It was just saying on this small piece of plywood that hadn't been shot yet that it just didn't try to shoot back. Legally dead and HM3 are going to pay with death. As it actually is two for Plav, but both Murray and Breadstick find one each. And now just a 1v3 before we reach max overtime. And I think just the, the amount of HP is going to be very hard for Breadstick to work with. They don't don't even find one so max overtime is round where 15. we are yeah round 15 nec where they choose to go i think is the most crucial part of this i mean it has to be the bathroom right that's the only place where they've really found any success either of these teams on defense or wait did they not? Oh, no, 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 no. I see, I see. They lost last one. They can't go right back. Uh, I think we're just going to see more second floor. We're going to see like four Don. Yep. Four rounds that are not on second floor. We've been seeing the same objective play out time and time again with the way that these back and forth rounds have been going. So I uh, all three overtime rounds on the second floor. And Attackers need to locate and defeat once again, Platteville on the attack, which is advantageous. Okay, so um, this is the... 15th round of the game, Treasure. This is the 11th round of armory that we've gone to. So much. So much armory. I just I, like. I feel like I can't even differentiate on, like, it's, it's either Platteville attack it's, or it's, NEC it, attack. Like, that's the It blends it kinds of rounds. We've seen so much of armory that to me it just blends together all of them just kind of melt and ooze together that it's really hard to differentiate what gives platteville the victory what gives nec the victory because there's just so many similarities between them that there's minuscule differences between all of this but i'm just i'm surprised that nec would choose to go back to armory when just We've seen so much of it, and the only way that you can see 11 runs of armory is a lot of defensive losses on this side. In NEC, yeah. there was no shortage of armory Bob losses. Hmm. Okay. Uh, you, University of Wisconsin, Platteville over here, focusing up right underneath objective. All five players on the ground on the northwest side of the map. I'm not sure what they're going for right here, but Bot is taking a little gander at them. He's decided to peel on out of that. He knows drones are going to be coming, and he is perfectly prepared to baffle and bamboozle them. He's just wasted some time while he can, especially if University of Wisconsin is going to be standing outside for so long. I mean, that's a minute off the clock already and no real progress. Progress is something that Platteville does very, very small. They, you know, maybe get a kill where they need to in these first, like, minute, 32 minutes. But the last 60 seconds is where Platteville kind of starts to kick it up a notch. And they really push the objective. It sometimes comes to bite them in the end. But sometimes if they do have those opening kills, if they've got, like, one or two on their side then uh, there isn't much NEC can do to stop that flurry that Platteville just kind of leads towards them as Pancake actually has to back up to stop the soft destruction as Murray is going to be the first death. Platteville is going to be the first team to lose somebody. And that means that Bot is still going to be able to roam around the map. I think it's going to hurt a lot of Platteville's attack here. Yeah, now he's got a sting. No longer able to help his teammates. He's relegated to cam duty here. Watching the backup for the teammates. One minute left. That's two off of the clock, and they're still fighting going on downstairs. Boo is the one to be doing it, though, on Nook, but ooh, cooking the grenade for too long. Bot finds another one on the round. Platteville finding match point twice before this point. But now things are starting to fall apart for them. Hatchet Thumb is going to be the first defender to fall, though, as Breadstick finds his way in. He's been on a roll a bomb recently. Has been located. They Lost so much time though it's gonna make it really difficult to make this happen but has to come on up those stairs taking a lot of damage through the wall but legally dead hanging on with just one hp just not quite find the mark to finish off that last one through the wall and bot is back inside there's no heals this time thunderbird is off the clock yeah but i think the the amount of damage given towards legally dead is more than enough there it is breadstick gone it's two members left 
before NEC gets the victory, and just what a back and forth this map has been. 10 seconds left, the Lion is gonna give away the position, and actually HM3, despite the Lion Pings, doesn't get the kill, and HM3, the last one alive, perishes, so there it is, NEC, three maps, 15 rounds in the end, a hard fought victory, they pull it out with Ghost Killer at the top. <laughs> Absolutely. And he deserves it quite well with all of the work that he's put in across this series. Taking this one from behind, they were down on match point mm. twice, hit that even match point finally yeah. in round 15. Uh, this was an <laughs> absolute slugger all the way through match one and three. Really showed you just how even these two teams were, but it's New England College that gets out of this one sitting on that 2-0 record. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a slugfest, I think, for sure. 11 rounds of armory. I saw so many defenses just yeah, it did not go the way that you would have thought. But, I mean, yeah, with NEC coming away with the victory, they do win this one out. And I think we're ending, like, just in time for the 10 p.m. match. Three minutes to go before, right. finally, it is, it is time for you to get a fresh new slate as I am <laughs> actually going to go away and you get a nice new uh, broadcasting buddy. I'll be very exciting. Great as always to be with you, Light Rose. A huge shout out to yes, our production behind the scenes, Peak and Unnamed Gamer, making all that stuff happen. So huge shout out to those guys uh, if you're looking for some good production and observation work there. But we'll be back after a bit of a break.
Howdy, everybody. I'm Treasure, and I'm back here for our second match of the night with the nearly omniscient Time to Light. How are you doing, Time to Light? I'm great. I'm really excited to get into the Legends Conference here at NECC. Of course, our, week, our third week of play, but second game. Uh, how'd you like our 15-round uh, banger before this one? <laughs> Oh man, we did so much, so much armory. Like we were thinking about that afterwards. Like, wait a second, how many, how many rounds do we go up there for? Is back to back just slamming those out. It was a real solid one to be casting, though those two teams really pouring their heart out. But up next, we got Bradley University and the University of British Columbia for this next match, like you mentioned in the Legends division. Yeah, and Bradley Esports. It's Cyclone, Worst Player, Shouta, Piercing, and. Linus dab tips. I love that. That is amazing. Whereas I, I believe piercing is a friend of mine. I I'm not a hundred percent sure. Hold up. I'm totally not <laughs> you believe? His I, I believe. Well, I, <laughs> I don't know if it's the same sure. person. This is, this is an six. old roster. Comp siege player, Bradley University player. Yeah, I know him. Ah, I've known this guy for like go. two years. That's so cool. <laughs> Small world. Small world of Siege, truly. That actually, Bradley's roster, uh, interestingly old. All seniors that are actually signed up on their roster, except for Piercing, the one junior on their roster, including uh, the other two that aren't pictured here for today. So that's pretty neat over there. Lots of engineering here as well. We do see quite a bit of that uh, from the Siege players. So lots, lots and lots of math. Oh, hey. That means they're prepped and ready to get going. They have all the geometry prepped for the game itself. Let's take yeah, a look at the I'm University staying. of British Columbia as they come into this one on the right side of your screen. Nikodim, Egg Life, Mad, Kaiken, and Enrique. I'm not even sure how to say that. I'm totally not checking. The wildest thing is this is just Eric. Eric. <laughs> is it really He's just Eric? He's giving us as many consonants what? as possible. Yeah, yeah, a real caster's nightmare. Shout out to Eric <laughs> for that. Er Eric, Eric, uh, yeah. uh, a, a little bit younger roster here. Not, not anything too crazy though. Three seniors for them as well. And I think we're ready to check out what maps we're headed to for this series. Yeah. Maps taking a look across the board. Oregon and Cafe, the first two bands, surprising ones to say the very least. Usually they make it a little bit further on, but maps number one and two will be Villa and Theme back to back. I'm a little surprised that Theme made it this far and was picked as a matter of fact, but Club the Decider coming through. I don't think I'm too surprised that Club's left over as a decider. A lot of teams know how to play it. Of course, it's fallen out of favor just a small amount, but I can say with fairly good certainty that Villa should be starting off between these two squads about as big of a banger as we just saw Border was. Yeah, I, I feel like I guess most teams are not, not comfortable playing on Clubhouse if you're playing a lot of competitive Siege. That's just the nature of the beast. It's like the scrim map so it makes a lot of sense for it to be making the distance uh, a lot of these otherwise pretty boxy pretty hard breach oriented uh crab like i like to think maps that we have for today between villa theme and club and the the way that you can scrim these is similar to that of the way you play them there aren't many notable differences you'll see at least between villa and club there are some pocket strats you can pull out but most of them has been seen considering how long they've been in the pool Bradley looking to pick up the second attacker ban, with Maverick going out first, Jackal the second ban, no Thatcher ban, contrary to what we thought with our ticker, thank you very much, Peek, and I'm a little surprised to not see a Nook ban either. The combination of the two usually come through, but the lack of both, a little surprising. Yeah, and so does uh, Maverick getting the axe right there. Uh, on, on Villa, it's kind of interesting. He doesn't see a whole ton of play usually. The Valkyrie, I'm a, I'm a big advocate for that one. Uh, she'll be really strong here. She can make a lot of these big corners on the second floor hallways a lot stronger for the defense just because you need to keep eyes on it even if you don't have players there. Well, here are the final ban. Valkyrie, I, I believe you said you saw Nikodim say curious i i think this ban phase in the defender side is about as straightforward as things get if i had a dollar for every time that valkyrie and mira were banned together much less separately inside of a map then i'd probably be able to retire by the end of next week but unfortunately that's not the case so this game still going and i'm still here <laughs> but UBC starting off on the defensive side aviator games an unsurprising first defensive side pick for them 
One note I want to bring up is the Warden selection. Defenders that indicates that UBC's done a little bit of their research, because a lot of times you only pick a Warden into a team that plays a lot of utility, and you don't always see that being the case here at NECC, but at the Legend stage, I suppose that would be the case. Yeah, that's a little bit interesting. Uh, this objective does kind of beg some, some smoke play, but uh, Linus locking in the grip lock right off the bat this isn't something that I anticipate right off the bat. That's not something I plan for. Nook, like you were mentioning, is right up there as well. I mean, she's got a big benefit that she brings frag grenades and she's going to do more on that flanking side for the team. 10 seconds left before insertion. I want to question Five you treasure remain. on this one. Looking at Bradley's attacking lineup, now that it's locked in, I noted the fact that the Thatcher wasn't banned and the Nook wasn't banned. Seeing the Nook here alongside the Gridlock. By the way, Gridlock has an M249 in hand. Just wanted to note that. Usually I bring the F9. Every time, actually, I play the Gridlock, I play F90 because it's just a better weapon. But Especially now after the recoil reworks yeah, as an SMG exactly. or as an LMG. Yeah, so pretty neat to see right there. Uh, shout out there on Sophia has made that change since uh, over from the LMGE, which used to be busted up until uh, just a bit ago, is now just not the viable option over the M249. Or not the M249, the M760. LMGE. Well, the LMG and the M760, yes. But into the M762, I like the call. They, this indicates aggression here for Bradley, and quickly so. Worst, walking forward quickly so, trying to clear out that 90 side with the Wamai, where Mad decides to lay for the time being. You can see not only the Jaeger on red, but I believe that's the Malusi down below. That's Eric, with a lot of consonants at the end, sitting down on the bottom side there. Kaiken trying to take the first engagement, but actually baiting Cyclone into Mad's line of sight, and the opening actually goes the way of the University of British Columbia. Yeah, it's really nice there. I was going to say, Kaiken is going to be in a really strong position there, especially with uh, an east side take like that. He has to give up the position so quickly, though. That's not all that he's looking to go for, especially losing so much HP, but a uh, kill is plenty for the time, and uh, for Eric is still going to ready to make a move over there. Shibik finds Shouda there, and the attack is starting to blunt as they put all their eggs in this basket, trying to come down the hallway, and with these long lines of sight being washed really well by UBC, there's not much they can do to really wiggle out there. I was talking about the fact that the Warden's on the board, but not a whole lot of flash or smoke-based utility being brought by Bradley here. I don't know if it's a wasted pick there for Nico, because you still have that MPX in hand, contrary to what you would have if the Valkyrie was not banned. Also, a 1.5 certainly does not hurt on that weapon. But it's Bradley with no seemingly easy way into the site. You have a whole lot of flank watch. Congratulations, but you need to be able to get forward in order for this UBC side to even start flanking you, and they haven't even completed that task yet. And now as we finally reach the action phase of the action phase, the final 50 or so seconds, they're just not aggressive. They're, they've hurried up around this north side of the map towards the south side itself they've reached the connectors as they stand yet they've done a whole lot of nothing off the back of it and linus is very lucky to be alive well and they find <laughs> a kill hello all right well you peeked me a little bit i've got more bullets to throw down range works player finds one as well this actually evens up the player count as the plan's going to start going down over here in map oh, oh one from behind eric finds that flank he finds two for his time and the diffuser is down on the oh, ground so the defenders are able to get this one out even if it was oh so close but eric just doesn't need anyone he's going to do it all himself I find that morbidly ironic. I talked about the fact that they didn't aggress and didn't have a flank to watch, and then as soon as they aggressed, they had a flank to worry about, and then just did not even pay attention to it because they used all of the track stingers just a little bit too early. They didn't have any towards 90, none around towards the landing side. They couldn't do anything about a very well-timed flank from Eric. The swing around, that's a double, by the way. It was Linus in that one versus, th or one versus three as it stood, and a nice little casual swing Defenders from Eric will shut them down to make sure there's no shot of coming back in that one. I was talking about needing the flank watch and not needing the flank watch. Apparently they did so and unfortunately didn't have any left because when I made that conversation point they'd have already used all their tracks to <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're really impactful. That tracks they do a lot with no flank uh, coming out, at least no wide flank, no wide roam. They end up being the same as if they just stayed in the pocket all game. Uh, this time they're switching off, so someone that's going to be a little more easy to guarantee the value on that anti roaming mechanic. So Linus switching over to the Nomad, so air jabs a little more conventionally picked more often, but otherwise the roster is looking pretty similar to that. Fake the lock in. 
not all that much changing, and I, I feel the note is, at least based off the previous round, the fact that they're not going with a primary hard reach, which I find a little interesting, especially considering it's trophy statuary, but the main note off of that, that means they're going to push in the south side. This should be a full horizontal take as soon as they make it to the top floor. Maybe a little bit of aggression on the bottom floor. You can see Linus around that 90 side, maybe trying to aggress there, but even then, they don't have any hard reach to call an audible. They have to go with plan A, because usually you have teams with plans B, C, D, and E trying to go down the alphabet. That cannot be the case here for Bradley. That's keep a barrier going right there in front of that. No, oh, man, it's going to be a problem. It's going to slow him down quite a bit. He doesn't get to just toss air jabs in and get the area right up ahead of his team. He's going to slow down quite a bit. He can really put all of his resources out on this to use up the realm. Trying to pre-fire this, trying to catch a head if it's going to be available for him for even a moment he's playing. Really, to die here at this point, he finds that kill and he's going to go right back into this fight on 90 that he really anticipates, but there's less pressure now that they know he's there. Eric's been down behind the sofa. I don't know if they're aware of the fact that Eric is down on that side of ABG. The swing from Kaiken. They find a down, looking to bring out the M590. They will indeed find the down. Unfortunately, not the follow-up kill, nor the finish on the Cyclone. The issue now here for the Bradley attack is the fact that they have about 30 HP total between Shouta and Cyclone. 100 yeah on Piercing, who needs to continue to frag out. And I suppose a bright side is the fact that Eric will not be picked up. They have been left to die around the Aviator side. But UBC still have an advantage. Not only do they have the sight in their favor, but they have a whole lot of time to work with, that being a minute 20 to just chill and bait in Bradley, and Bradley doesn't have the HP to compete. Yeah, they're just gonna hold their angles here, look for those drones coming in like Shout is right now, no one quite has angles on those, but keep that intel away from the attackers is what the defenders have to play to. They've set up a good defense for themselves for this last time, as long as that timer isn't gonna be such a problem for them. Pushing up here, Cyclone, pre-firing that angle, he doesn't quite know exactly where is going to be. Mashiba does know, though, that the drone's been coming in right on him. Nico finds another one for the defense. This is going to be even more suffocating for Piercing and Cyclone, who need to rotate now. Oh no, and they're rotating exactly to where I said they couldn't go. They don't have that plan B of going master and trying to open up that statuary wall. The only issue now is trying to walk past Mad, and they don't have the time to drone him out. You can see Mad just casually waiting around towards the master closet. They will find one. Cyclone does get a refract, but there's only 20 seconds, and they have 25 HP to work with. The aggression can certainly be there here for this Dokebi. They'll pop the Syria Gate, which almost certainly would have killed them should they have walked through unbridled aggression is completely unrequited as UBC will indeed win the second. The defensive side continues to hold strong. Yeah, defense looking really nice right there. They had a total control of that once they found that player advantage. I mean, even like uh, <laughs> that Shiba giving a full call out. He knew exactly what angle he's going to go for, pre-firing that one and taking the head along with it and taking any last chances to get right there that kill we just saw. Uh, taking any chance left for the attackers to win right there. UBC looking pretty confident in these first two rounds with a real quick pace. Yeah, and a big note Defender is the fact that, well, yeah, UBC's 1-2-0. It's come down to a 1v3 and a 1v2. And at this point, it really has come down to attempted hero plays on Bradley. But if a single gunfight goes awry there for UBC, they almost certainly lose the round. If they can't find that aggression maybe from their maestro and it turns into a 2v2 as they start to aggress, then you're looking at a possible win there for Bradley. Now, I'm talking about if, ands, or buts. I don't do those. I do absolutes, as the old saying goes that everybody's seen the clip on Instagram. But Bradley's attack needs to be able to absolutely find a round, and they've yet to do so. It's Dining Kitchen with the tertiary bombsite for UBC finally coming into the fray, and another bandit on the board. This one I don't understand because impact EMPs exist. And Badger exists, but you know, you do you. Locate and a bomb. Yeah, there's been quite a bit of resources on these breaching walls, but um, no Thatcher to be seen from the attack, anyways, so it might just end up playing, uh, yeah. It's going to be really hard to deal with those unless someone just gets a gun inside sight, at which point that hard breach isn't going to matter much. So I think Nico's actually going to get quite a lot of value off that. A lot, a lot of C4s. The defense, three of them, they're going to be playing really heavily off of the pulse uh, from below. Uh, thus, Bradley is attacking from the south side where they can avoid that for as long as possible. What do you do here if you're on the defensive side? Right now, Coach Treasure on the board. If, if you're UBC, do you aggress onto this far side of the map, or do you give them that far side control on the top of the board? 
I think you gotta put a little bit of pressure on it. Like, exactly what Eric's doing right here. I don't think any more players should be dedicated to it, because you don't have players in that position already. You can't push up any further on the defense. That's just not how that works. You push yourself out of position, you can't even refrag. So having one player up there to try and slow it down as much as you can now that you've realized where the attack's coming from. But otherwise, you have to wait for that main game plan that you've set up for the defense. They seemingly know what they want to do. Eric backs away at nearly the worst time. They're going to crouch into this swing. The information there and worst is dropped. A 1.5 on the FMG9, seemingly ear-required. They're unrequired as they look to just drop that nook. And Bradley Esports again dropped the opening pick. They cannot win some of these opening duels. And once more, they're put on the back foot, of which they seemingly don't have a cursory answer for. I love that UBC won't stay in a position if they have any disadvantage on it, like uh, Eric and Kaiken, especially when they're playing up front. If they take some shots and it's an even angle, they just say, nope, I can I can give some space away. And right now, that's been exactly what nets them these early opening kills that have sent these last couple of rounds in their favor, including this one right here. Pearson's got to play aggressive here. He's got to find some of these roamers and get anything to work with for the team. But there's danger in every direction, including below. Changing match! Goodness, that's just another lineup here for Bradley. They cannot win some of these 1v1s, and not only are they losing 1v1s, they're losing continuous 1v1s, and sometimes synonymous 1v1s. Eric, a nice toss up and over on the red stairs. We'll find the final kill required. The gridlock not surviving that one. Sent to the stratosphere and into the shadow realm, as UBC will complete the rotation successfully. A 3 0 start here on the defensive side, and a clean one at that. Finally, a clean round win. Yeah, this really just being one on the back of the Roamers. They're doing a great job of assessing the threat. Getting to it <laughs> exactly. And I mean, just plain out, out shooting Bradley's attack right now. Attackers need to locate and defeat Bradley, the question now remains, is it based off of your prep or is it based off of gun skill? Because at this point, it seems like a little bit of a combination of the two. The issue they run into is the fact that you have to fix one and then the other. It's usually the prep and then gun skill. They just haven't been given the opportunity to fix their prep. They're trying to get across the map. They're trying to get to the top floor above that kitchen dining site or even just outside the site itself. But they're not even given the opportunity to do so. Nico spending a calendar year trying to set up their deployable shield. He's doing the deployable. On this. I, I love it. it. A little Macarena, I suppose. Oh, except yeah. with his feet. Uh, is that a thing? The foot Macarena? <laughs> I don't know. Foot Macarena. Probably. It can be now. I, uh, Nico's uh, might be the first one this to is, be doing it. It was, it was funny for the first like three seconds, but now I'm worried. This is uh, problematic. This is, this is the real reason. Prep base. This is the real reason they're playing Warden, so they don't have any other prep to do. <laughs> you oh, can see him yeah. shaking their head. <laughs> I think I think he knows at this point. It's been one minute. It's been one full minute of placing that shield, and it's not that working out. Done. You gotta just put it somewhere else. Put it next to the map table, please. All right, that's not a bad position either. It's gonna be nice for playing in <laughs> the ball, but it's not quite the same as getting to cover red stairs as effectively. Unfortunately, we got a camera watching the area though, so maybe that'll help. Him out. You know, I, I love the way you, you talk about it. It's the alliteration of the deployable dance. The deployable dance. Yeah, I've been there. I've been there. I've, I've, I know how it is. I, I've seen a few people actually do that, where they just try and get the, the shield down on the table. I, I saw it on, I think, Saturday or Sunday when I was casting a different game, but it was still a little easier. At that point, it was an alibi, but, well, Eric, on a, another flank, this time from the outside of the building, trying to go back across the inside of the building. Selma set up inside of the vault, so they do open up at least one area of attack. Now they're aggressing up brown, as we saw in prior iterations. Piercing is also prepped down below with those Argus cameras. Sam Fisher himself trying to find some of the information, maybe even some of the kills to the floor. Egg seemingly having information now that Selma's prepped around the back side of them, whipping out the M590. But now UBC, they don't have an opening pick, and with 90 seconds left, Bradley have two different avenues into the site and prep outside of the sites themselves. This is a significantly better round for Bradley, and as I say that, they lose likes. My bad. Yep, yet another round with the first pick, but they have a refrag pretty immediately after. It's going to be a bloody one here in these early moments. That shield's not going to the same work for Nico, and now there's his gun as his head is taken off here. Players pushing up into study, have good angle all the way down. They can't rotate into a site from red stairs. Uh, Kaiken making the attempt right now. He's got Eric right at his back. Oh, I guess he can rotate in through red stairs as the attackers look away. 
well timed on that one piercing swing of their own around that study side but it seems to be a fairly one-dimensional push at this point here for bradley they want to go down the long hallway near brown stairs and into the site itself but kaiken holding that across not only from the shelves and across from the couch but across towards the study door itself where we saw piercing a little bit earlier on there's a second swing from piercing but kaiken just circumventing it a little bit of acrobatics on the back side of the sofa looking for a second now is worse and a one versus three they find the second as well the diffuser not so much in hand though it's down around the back side of study and in towards the brown stairs of which egg is well aware of egg by the way has not taken a single gunfight thus far in this game and worst player seemingly doesn't have an easy avenue of attack onto that diffuser they want to aggress around towards brown stairs but as time's ticking away it's just the mute waiting on the other side there's no easy way to the diffuser and then to get it down they do indeed grab the diffuser but that will be their undoing worst will run out of time egg should find them they don't even have to egg has still yet to take a gunfight at the end of round four amazing i, I <laughs> he was so ready he just forgot about the possibility of the long arm i mean he, he gets out just fine with it but but that's that's a little bit of a problem once time here it hits zero though he's got plenty of time to run around with that mossberg find whoever he's having seven whole seconds to run around so i mean they couldn't have gone far they only had a couple seconds uh, ahead of him running out so Four rounds in a row for UBC right now. University of British Columbia is chilling, feeling fine. They Defenders got the perfect defense the rotation. They're looking attack. at getting themselves another one. They're trying to speed run for it. Remember, trophy saturate last time around was another close round, of which the four rounds UBC has won, three of them have been down to 1vxs that have been fairly close. A 1v3 that really could have been a one round for Bradley should they have dealt with a flank. A 1v2 that certainly could have gone their way should they have killed the Maestro and done a little bit more of due diligence inside of Master. And then last round, it was a 1v1. The only issue was, well, they didn't clear out the mute, nor did they have any information to work off of, because once more, they took a little bit too much time to aggress. They had all the control yet just did not aggress with the control they built up. Finally, they are now given an opportunity. I feel like in this situation, they have a little bit of a better shot. I like the operator selection on the attacking side as well, piercing notably on that buck, but worst player flexing on towards the Osa. From what we saw in the prior round, they were playing on the Zofia, really trying to get aggressive. This time they can do so once more, but not only do they have a higher fire in the PBW, they have the sight prep and the possibility of getting that diffuser down with the talent shields. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking after that last round, that, that username, uh, I don't, you gotta change it. You gotta change it. The flick's Bats. right on. Oh, like, there's, there's nothing doing right there. I was, people are gonna get confused. Like, there, there's problems right there. Uh, but, we got some smoke grenades here. This actually would have been something relevant for uh, the warden before, but we don't see a repeat of that. Instead, on the defense, it's uh, some droning, actually, or some cameras brought by the maestro. Once again, now they're on the second floor. Uh, otherwise, pretty well rounded just to uh, hold up on the utility game. And this isn't any different from the last time they played the site either. And that's one issue that you'll see here for UBC. If you don't change things, Bradley's going to be able to adapt. Nico trying to change their point of attack. However, well, we know that Worst had seen that angle prior. He's still looking to hold on the backside of the Talon Shield. You can see Mad sitting inside of Astro, waiting for a push to come through that bathroom half, of which Cyclone resides. And they're looking to get aggressive, but I don't know if they're going to be able to clear out that Maestro in the backside of Astro. This is a fairly well-spread push and a fairly well-timed one at that here for Bradley. The issue is, again, they have yet to find a kill 90 seconds into the round. Attackers drop the diffuser. They have a lot of angles directly into sight, cutting off uh, rotations, but they Ooh. don't have a lot that they can do with it on any angles. Those first trades uh, are not bad for them, but you look at things like worst player up there on the window, he's under constant fire from Nikodim. There's nothing he can do about that, especially with this additional shield going up in the smoke. He won't know what that angle to look at is. Even if he knows the exact pre-fire for the doorway, it's just not there anymore after that no Cuba barrier has gone down. Eric finds Linus. That's uh, one of those flanking maneuvers from the attack that just not going to get to pan out and kaiken's looking for more that shadow has to watch behind him he knows there could be pressure coming down the first floor because the first floor hasn't been cleared at all the roam is still well alive i feel like this round is already over though ubc well yes they have a 3v3 as kaiken dies on that bottom side it was fairly well watched by shouta 
they're down to no hard breach, of which seemingly was their plan, as you saw below. Luckily, it's now down to a 2v3, as they've continued to win a few of these gunfights. Eric, with again aggression around the back side of this Astro Rotate, gets enough damage to down Shouta, but they're down to 1 HP, and now down and dead. It's Egg in a 1 versus 3, the C4 thrown through, does not bind any damage, much less a kill, and finally, Bradley pick up a round off the back of the aggression from the Talon Shield. It was indeed UBC's undoing, as Bradley pick up their first. Yep, that drought is finally ended, but I think it's more at the hands of University of British Columbia more than anything. They're over-peaking really heavily. I think four rounds in a row has them on that high, has them really feeling themselves right now. You can tell with the way that they're shooting, the way they're taking these angles, but it's undue risk that they're willing to take right here, taking every gunfight possible, and that's kind of... That's coming away from what I was ladding them for Defenders earlier in the first, like, three rounds, attackers. where they're playing really smart, only taking fights where they know they're going to get more value. A little bit of coordination in terms of putting up reinforcements. Do you ever see that when you play ranked, by the way? Do you ever, like, notice that you put up a reinforcement with somebody next to you? I, I love that coordination, because it's just, like, like one of those... Done. Exactly. Yeah, Oddly satisfying things you see on the internet. Bomb. It's like, yeah. well, yeah. It's that, but with Rainbow Six, right, like you're cutting into the like Play-Doh or like the like Magic Sand stuff. Exactly, I love those. Those are great. Watching like anyway, Costco, we did, guys. like pizza sauce machine. That true. Oh my goodness. By nostalgia.exe. There's there's so much there's so much just dopamine waiting for you on the internet. Attackers Watch are heading out to defuse a bomb. A, a, a quick the note about differences, by the way, because between rounds two and round five, we didn't see any differences in terms of the defensive defuser. setup here in Trophy Saturday. Now we do between round two, five, and six, I suppose, second or third final round on the secondary site. Instead of the Maestro, we see the switch, while still keeping the same nation as consistency, they do switch onto the Alibi, which indicates more aggression here. And I understand it because Mad was the first to die in the previous round, while well, yeah, they traded out with that Ace, of which is not on the board again here in Brad. Well, Nico, the first to find a kill, oh, a double at that. No. Shouta dropped around towards the Astro Stairs. A turd attempt is unsuccessful as Piercing will finally get a refrag, but two for one, certainly advantageous here for the defensive side. And Matt's looking for another, almost finds it. Bradley, you guys are worrying me. Three through the basement. You see that barbed wire, you keep going. No, no, don't take that fight, please. And then they do it again. Uh, at least they find the kill eventually. Nico going down, but I'm sure he's feeling just fine for He's got the intel as well to work with. And his teammates are already watching this angle anyways onto Astro's stairs and Astro window. Like, Kaiken's happy to stay here. He has spent all round last round right here. He's already in the game. He's got the C4 prepped as well. And as soon as he gets any information to work off, he's going to chalk him that one right in. Prepped. The question is, do they clear out that Kiva barrier before it's thrown forward? I don't think they have anything to do so. Maybe an Ash charge, but I don't know if they've used all of nope. them. Luckily, Piercing able to back away before Mad reacts quickly bed. enough. Down goes the Prisma. That should bait piercing should they try and look through the floor that's not actually meant for the rotate that's meant through for that Reloading. floor breach that we've seen a little bit on the screen but piercing's still not trying to go 70 seconds left in this round and bradley again have to start to go they have to find an entry pick into the site because egg still hasn't been cleared out of that trophy side you can see bradley need to push but they don't have an avenue of an attack forward Oh, that head, you see the Neuron activation of Mad Sheep's head every single time. The Nitro Cell we were watching get prepped earlier has gone, and it has not gotten anything. Cyclone finds the kill on Kaiken. He doesn't get to hold that angle any longer, but there's still one player over there that is not going to be uh, known to the... Oh, the attackers of Mad Sheep, but does take the fight with Linus. He had the advantage, uh, he barely makes it out with his life there. Eric cleans up Cyclone no and Egg, waiting around for that final opportunity, find Piercing. Egg was cloaked in the reinforcement, even looking through Piercing's line of sight. With x-ray vision, by the way, I could barely see Egg on the reinforcement. It's not even Ember Rise skins, by the way. That's just the fact that it's a weird skin on the Kaid. Anyway, Bradley lose once more, and that was, again, a more of a clean round for UBC. Not only did they have the opening two picks, but they had a decent bit of prep into the round. It was brought down to a 3v3, yeah, but Bradley did not have an easy way into the site, nor did they have a free avenue of attack onto any individual operator on the defensive side. Attackers UBC, again, well prepped and well thought to pick up a 5-1 halftime advantage. Uh, treasure... I, I'm usually a little bit of an optimist when I cast, but down five 
Yeah, they're gonna have to rely, I think, on UBC's overconfidence. It's won them around Adapters before. The uh, the they're on defense now. Things are gonna switch up quite a bit. It may always be a defense side of map. There's always that uh, opportunity between these teams. Like, I don't think it's ever out, like, done and dusted. Uh, until we've at least seen yeah, what their defense is gonna look like. If they lose this next one, then it's like a real stunning boss. I'll go, okay, no, it's just, Five seconds just diff on this map. That's what it is. But they've got an opportunity here. Five one half Attackers is definitely a dire situation. But now the round is going on their terms. They don't have to play in the building at Bradley's whim. They can choose their own pace. I feel UBC just want to hold W here. Now their operator selection does not actually indicate that, but I, I'm a praying man because it would be really funny to see UBC just to hold W in. A Thorin selection early on which is a little surprising considering you want to bring that out like as a pocket pick and try and catch this UBC side off guard later on in the half, but uh, that actually requires later on in the half to come, and, well, they're two away from dropping this, and they've only picked up a round of six, so not a guarantee by any means. Worst player right here, he knows he's looking for the camp specifically, that's why he's flicking down to the floor. Uh, he's expecting one to come in because they know he is there. None of them did though, so he's got a little bit of time. Elsewhere, his teammate finds a kill over there on Red Stairs. The same place we saw the opening frag on the last half when the teams were swapped. So, always a nice position to be in. Gotta watch it nice and carefully, especially the early round. Frag grenades going out from below, a little bit nerfed on that depth charge use, but still putting plenty of damage on Shouting even if he's up on top of the counter. And even elevated, you take about 50 damage or so from 125 to about, I don't know, 65, give or take. I don't know if that's math. It's probably 60 damage because, you know, algebra or addition is a bit of my forte. Decent swing from worst does indeed drop egg. They prove time and time again to not indeed be the worst player. Unfortunately, Bradley, now in a 1v3, has left them in a 1v3. And UBC in a fairly good scenario, and it's mad to swing off the back of it. Relatively easy fight there for the Flores, and no easy way for Bradley to win some of these rounds. They don't even have an avenue of attack on the defensive side. UBC are just walking all over them, and they're already on map point. Yeah, absolutely blazing through this first map thus far. This is Bradley's map pick, too, so he might even dwell to be a worse matchup for them. Quite unfortunately, they got to hold on, though. The hope is not all out of this match before. I've seen crazier things happen before, and, of course, that theme will be a whole wipe of the round count. Getting them ready to go Attackers into map two. need to locate and defuse as many bombs as they can. Do you, do you think we see any more of this half? Because Trophy Statuary is certainly a defender side in sight, but it's only like 54 to 46. And UBC have proven that percentages don't mean jack squat. Yeah, no, I, uh, not to be a Debbie Downer, not to be a passive or a pessimist. Uh, there's no pacifism here. So plenty, <laughs> plenty of headshots here, way too many firearms for any pacifism in Rainbow Six Siege. Not even. Uh, was it Egg, who was on 0-0 zero, zero, zero for a while, he's even had to resort to some violence. I feel, the, who is the most pacifist operator? You, you got an option there? Because I, I like you, fair, fair sure, sure. Monty, yeah, I suppose, that would, that would make sense. Considering I it's, it's gotta be a shield operator, right? I, I mean, Maybe and the other ones can actually... A, a no that would be weird. I mean, it's either Monty or Clash. That's That's got to be your two options, yeah. because both of them have a full shield without a gun out, if you're using it correctly. Yeah. I don't know. They do, they do also have military-grade firearms strapped to the back. So I feel like you can only get self-pacifist as, uh, as military police. Hey, they got the strap. It's okay. It's okay. It's, it's legal in some states, depending on whether it's a machine... Actually, Monty's pistols are legal in those states. Not so much Clash. Is, is I think it's legal when you're doing whatever weapons. whatever this whole thing is. It's not it's not quite uh, fighting the baddies, but it's uh, I don't know, scribs, I guess. You never know. Honestly, it's it's always a question mark. Clean opening shot, Kike is dropping, piercing, and the Aruni down early means already you see a disadvantage here on the Bradley defense. The early aggression seemingly shut down to open things up. Never an advantageous position. And oh, he's just uh, what? It. <laughs> yeah, there's there's no reason for UBC to slow things down either. I think they have a whole lot of information early on, which is beneficial for them because they don't have to waste time droning late on in the round, which was the complete opposite. Of 
kill himself with Bradley. By the way, very lucky to be alive as an egg, because they probably should have killed them. But, a minute 30 left, and UBC have another man advantage, and oh, very lucky again to be alive. Worst! Good night, Nico. Yeah, worst player making much better use of that little angle. He's not shooting anything from his teammates, just mad. Um... <laughs> Kill right there to take the head off of his opponents, even on player count right now. And we're getting pretty late to the round. There's just over a minute left before that diffuser has to go down. Worst player once again holding up, lying down there, and he looks away at absolutely the worst time. Eric comes in, shoots him right in the back. He's backed up by Mad Shiva as well as his teammate has to come out. Shout out trying to take up the angle, but Mad Shiva finishes him off while the plan goes down. The has to pull up. There it is. The diffuser is still down though, and Egg is going to finish off that last one to take the round home. That was about as clean of a map as it probably could have been there for UBC. 84% win rate in the first half. They go 2-0 and in the second on their attacking side. Bradley are just cut down. And on the defensive side, they didn't find any foothold, even when the sights were theirs on paper. And then later on into that, or later on in the first half at minimum, it looked clean from UBC, not only from a standpoint of them playing staunch defense, but them controlling their own gunfights and it really didn't look like the pacing of Bradley was determining the game. Yeah, absolutely. They just did not get a word in edgewise, so to speak. And it's not really what you'd expect uh, looking off of these match counts so far. University of British Columbia is down two matches so far for this season. Bradley has one win in the pocket so far, so I think it's definitely going to be disheartening for them sitting here right after this last map. But they do have a little bit of break. They have a little bit of time to recuperate. Think about what they're going to be doing on theme park coming up in just a few minutes.
Eight rounds and 25 minutes, all that it took over on Villa for UBC to take Bradley Esports' map pick. Now as we head into the theme park, it's Bradley Esports' time to upset the team from the University of British Columbia, but they have to do it to force a third, that being Clubhouse. Welcome back, by the way, to the NECC third week of play. Time to late, still joined alongside me is Treasure, and Treasure, a Thatcher bit this time around, but it wasn't played whatsoever on the previous map. Yeah, it's going to make quite a bit of sense here going in the theme park. I mean, we, we saw how fast these games could go. So trying to slow things down, making sure that walls can stay up for as long as possible is going to be really important, especially in this first half for uh, Bradley. They have to come back from quite a bit of a deficit. I mean, mental in that Discord call has to be a little bit rough right now. That I hope that they took these last few minutes that we took on break to really psych themselves back into this, really get that reset that they're going to need after such a, a rough first map right there. I, the, I don't know if you heard me laughing, but I was laughing because of the Nook ban. Uh, they went from not yeah. banning Thatcher or Nook to banning both Thatcher and Nook here on theme. Now, here I understand a little bit more because having the wall denial is so much more important and having the lack of information that the Nook provides alongside the lack of sound info she provides is certainly beneficial to any attacking side, hence the reason they both are not off the board. The defensive ban, similar to that of the previous map, I'm not even going to touch on them because they're about as straightforward as things get. Valkyrie denies information, Mira exists. That, that's all I've got yep, for you. Yep. <laughs> no, that really is all she has to do. You just put us somewhere and you go, okay, well, we're not heading over there now. Uh, this is a much bigger map, and as far as the commonly usable space, we don't really count Villa's basement. It's uh, it's bonus. It comes up sometimes. Like, we see Cheeky pushes up through those stairs like we did on one Defenders of those rounds on last map. Attackers. But, for the most part, team's going to necessitate a lot more space as soon as Jackal is off this time. Linus snap at that one, uh, making sure to use it so a lot of intel for the attack is going to be important with him alongside Yon. the attack has really not worked out for Bradley though. That's their main issue from what I've seen because Shouda in the previous map just was not finding those early kills and was yeah looking to aggress with nade kills kind of being the norm here on theme. It could be a situation they try but there's not as much reachable floor around where UBC will almost certainly be playing. I saw theme played last week here in the NECC at the Legends Conference level no less but it was a whole lot of control around vaults that was really the point of contention. Now, we don't see Vault really prepped here around the far side, but it's still a conversation, that being Vault, by the way, but it's still a conversation of Bradley looking to aggress with nades and UBC either fully avoiding them or maybe not even having to run into that situation. I got something. Okay. Bradley moving quick here, getting right up to Arcade as fast as possible. A couple of players going all the way over here to camp. They can until immediately that's going to have to be used to break this Arrini gate, but they are already found out. UBC has uh, sprayed a few shots in their direction, but no one's really dedicating to that fight as Bradley pushes their way in. There really hasn't been any aggression from UBC. Surprisingly so, considering all the all of what they've heard. Egg trying to jump up and over onto the balcony, maybe trying to prep a line of sight across. The sound cue will certainly be heard as to their whereabouts on yellow stairs, but given the fact there's no breach to really try to aggress there, they shouldn't be worried about it all that much, maybe just noting it to their teams and comms. EE1D will be popped first time around, and with the Jackal ping across with the Ionox Canberra, they will know the fact that the Aroni may be able to aggress, and if at least opened things up, but while the damage only going the way of worst means Bradley are on the back foot already, but look down below. There's the Jackal trying to aggress. The problem they run into is I think they've been hurt as well. He has been hurt. Egg was pinned in that position for a while. He's able to move out though because no one's been watching the angle uh, up to him. Oh, he sees the Jackal. He's going to pick that one up. That's pretty easy. One on Linus is not even looking the right direction on him. No cams ahead. Nico finds a kill as well. Really starting to shut down the Bradley attack. They haven't even made some much ingress beyond those initial building, or initial rooms that they stepped into. Cyclone is inside, but Shout is still outside. He's just tried to drone for his teammates, and Egg still here on yellow. All the 
all the ground that they've gained, they have to take it right back after those last couple of minutes. Magnet ready. And it's now down to a 1v5. You have your ace left to load in an ace clutch scenario. I suppose they have to live up to their name, but it's significantly easier said than done. I suppose they have the weapon to do it, that being the AK-12. The problem they run into is there's so much utility available on this defensive side. Luckily, they drop egg to open things up, but Nico's there for the redundancy on the defensive side. The first swing unsuccessful, second time, not so much. The ace is dropped, and UBC again win the opening round on the defensive side. This time, significantly more clean than what we saw in Villa. Yeah, that's looking pretty scary. Like basically looking down the barrel on flawless there. I mean, Nico finds three just with the SMG 11. He's happy to run and gun his way through the machine pistol. Has that great up time and immediate ready to fire time as well. So he's able to sprint right into every fight that he wants. We're moving over to initiation room on the other side of the second floor on theme park. Bradley's going to have to devise a new plan here. They tried kind of stacking up all on each other going in through cafe and arcade. It just doesn't work out. We saw that one round on the previous map as well and it worries me because when i see that it typically means the team might have uh, given up a little bit you know i feel playing the sas operators on the defensive side is seemingly just a walking quick draw perk in call of duty <laughs> you, you were talking about the the draw oh, ability of the smg 11 because it's so it's honestly true that's the most important part about it because not only do you do a heck of a lot of damage you can pull that weapon up quickly from a sprint position and the amount of damage you do over time is so much better than really any other weapon the only disadvantage is long range engagements of which you don't see sas operators trying to take all that often and even then you're looking for a one shot headshot yeah. yeah, exactly. You're looking for a one-shot headshot, so it, even that conversation is relatively null and One of these days, Ubisoft is going to nerf the SMG-11 to a point where it's like a realistic gun instead of whatever monster it has always been. It's going to be one of the no. saddest days. Ubisoft with a sensible balancing decision? <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> this is for some reason the Mac 11 is just the strongest gun in the game for seven years running. Uh, so satisfying though, especially on those plays, just like what we were seeing earlier from Nico. Uh, Meshiba once again, or not Meshiba, playing on yellow in place where Egg was previously. It's a little bit of a different position, it's further out from sight now that we've moved on to the other one. Goyo shields, uh, or not shields anymore, but the canisters going off here. Nico's ready to buy himself some time to slow down this attack before anyone's I'm reloading. on top of him. Better to make use of it than to let it die unused. Using Gemini. If you have utility, goes unused and around, it's like just picking a recruit at that point without the extra secondary utility. At that point, it's even more of a waste than you think at face value. Cyclone finds the opener, but it's really going to be nullified with Nico dropping Shouta, who I believe was down below in barrels. I'm pretty sure Nico found that kill from the hatch as they dropped the Iona. Another across as Piercing is sent to the Shadow Realm and put down as they stand, or at least as they stood. It's down to a 2v4. There's only been 90 seconds transpired in this round, and they're being circled like a pack of sharks on the defensive side. UBC are encircling Bradley and then eating him up and eating him, unfortunately, alive as they can be no longer. Uh, a 1v4 this time, better than last time around. Oh, oh my no. Worst is, is dead. So very dead. Yeah, surrounded on all sides. Here, even Nico dropping down here to be the one to get the kills. Neither of the two angles he was prepped for before. <laughs> There's two of them over there as well at this point. Uh, University of British Columbia is just looking for any kills they can pick up here, uh, vying for each other for some of these cleanup kills at the end. I don't think Bradley's doing like a rough job of cleaning uh, out roamers. They've got some utility, definitely monitoring uh, for that. Like the Jackal, the Yon are definitely going to be oriented towards that play. But... Bradley is just playing so much faster. I mean, Nico is like a like a lightning bolt right now, jumping on anything he can immediately. And I think it's just that that a, a little bit of difference in familiarity with the drone and clear uh, cadence that they need. They're just not fast enough with it. They're putting the drones in there, sending someone in to uh, get the kill, but the reaction time between those two is long enough that the drone intel is not fresh enough anymore for players that are playing like Nico is right now. Oh god, Nico is 6 and oh. Yeah, I was, I was about to mention the fact Holy. that the, Nico is yet to die 
And I think that's a similar case for most of UBC. It's been a similar case for most of this series for UBC. Not entirely just not dying, but the dominance they've shown in some of these rounds, and continuous dominance at that. Egg is the only player to die, and they've done so twice, as the only opening pick whatsoever. And the only point around that is the fact that they were the opening pick in the prior round, that being the Cyclone on the ace. But Mad just decides, hey, late setup spawn peak, trying to catch him off guard, it works out perfectly. Jackal down, and no easy way to deal with things. Piercing's on the Grim, by the way. Just wanted to note that super duper quickly, because the swarm available, trying to find maybe information on that attacking side, finally so. Unfortunately, the information priority, that being the Jackal for possible roamers, already off the board as the Spanish operator has been well and truly dealt with. Yeah, but there's still plenty of presence over here. They saw <laughs> the punch out on the window, but there's still attackers or defenders up here to be dealt with. The drone has cleared out a lot of the top floor, though, so Shadow's an all right spot. He's stacking up right there with Worst Player, though. You don't usually want to see that on the roam clear, because I mean, if there is a roamer, if you over drone someone, that's going to be a quick collateral of two kills. Grabbed his is thrown through. That should be able to find damage. It finds absolutely nothing. Must have been caught behind some hard surface as well. Apparently it is. Egg even finding a kill onto Worst as they find absolutely nothing, not only out of their nades, but in terms of the round as a whole. The Sledge will find a few divots in the ground making the floor above Swiss cheese, but it's not going to matter if you can't find the kills off the back of it. And Bradley again have a two-man advantage, and we're only 90 seconds of the round. I feel like I've said that three times, and it's been three rounds. Well, unfortunately, there is a reason for that at this rate. Piercing here, just trying to drone on the can. He's got some players to be watching the cams up ahead of him, but there's a big task here to be dealt with. Even if they do make their way onto site, Eric takes more than one person to deal with. And with this player economy, just getting two people to deal with Eric at the same time is going to be rough. Even if they're able to kill all the rest of the team, they have to I mean, do it without losing more than one player. It takes a little bit of damage here, but he's able to get his deployable shield back up as Shouta and Piercing have kind of stalled out there at the top of Dragon Stairs right now. But going down the stairs, they're going to open themselves up to a couple angles from the side. Uh, the site itself. So wait for the hard breach to go off so they can kind of get a pitching angle. The Cyclone is going to be able to hold it any longer after he has his head taken off by the machine. He's just been watching and waiting for it. With Cyclone going down, that was around towards maintenance as well, and Kaiken with another kill towards that maintenance side. They're basically using this Clash as a pseudo Mira, of whom has been banned, by the way. Look at this angle, straight through the oh. bottom of the Clash Seal. That is disgusting, as is Nico. There is no way in the world for UBC to be taken out in some of these angles. There's no shot you drop the mute at that long of a range, and understandably so, Bradley will call a timeout because there's not a whole lot they can do in this situation. Yep. Uh, they gotta regroup here. They had like five minutes to uh, pause and think about things earlier, but after another full perfect rotation from the University of British Columbia defense, I mean, no no reason to have it if you're not going to use it. Just like utility, those pauses, you want to use them to your advantage as much as you possibly Defenders, can. Defenders, protect your bombs um, from being oh. defused by attackers. Uh. <laughs> better you better have been watching Kaiken. Oh, yeah, the angle straight to the clash. Bomb yeah, by attackers. I mean... We watch Kaiken for the second attempt, but that, that is a disgusting. I, I don't know if that's really exploiting. I feel like that's why they were making that notion. Because I, I feel they want to just take a second and be like, what the heck's going on? I, I don't think that's exploiting any game bugs. That would be the only reason they'd say, hey, this, this, and this. But they may just want to replicate it. Well, because as, as far as we can tell, that is just angle. underneath the clash shield, right? Five seconds remaining. Yeah, but it, I, I don't know if you're supposed to be allowed to be up there. On that Attackers are heading out to defuse a bomb. I don't know. They could, they could be. I, don't know. I think, I think that one's just mountable if you do it from the long side. But it's not like I'm pissed at healing. It hasn't come up yet. Let me, let me, let me open up Rainbow Six. Really quick. <laughs> Gonna go check. Be right back. All right, a lot of, you know, a lot of upstairs present from the defense here. What, what is weird? How do you want to know? Uh, it's like something completely unrelated to the game while I have a second, because I just got reminded of this weird things being like the throne bolt. Um, in my university, because of our firewall issues, uh, every 90 seconds, if you're just chilling in the siege lobby, you actually get like disconnected from the siege lobby. 
so you, if you open the game, you have to immediately find the game. And you can't just sit in a custom game. It's weird. It's very weird. Huh. Well, 90 seconds is actually uh, a pretty significant number like coming back to this game in particular ah. because that's the time that something ha <laughs> during which something has to happen oh for, the for us to see them get anything here. And uh, within those 90 seconds already, even just the one minute, Kaiken's got the first two kills. He got the fire going down from Eric, covering up that area. So even if they could kill Kaiken, they can't even move up on that ground side initiation uh or, sorry not initiation dragon stairs once again taken by the attackers but they're having a hard time getting any further than that in another round cycle has been waiting for nico to find out he knows because really aggressive so that's the play right there sometimes you just gotta ride out your own street and do it like that <laughs> the only reason that nico actually got aggressive through bathroom as well is because they dropped shout out down the long hallway as well they tried to find the finish and unfortunately they were unsuccessful and said adventure kaiken Again, aggression. They're five and zero thus far. I was about to make the mention, by the way, before Nico died and Kaiken found that kill. The fact that Kaiken and Eric and Kaiken, Kaiken, Eric, and Nico, apologies, were twelve and zero coming into this. Now Kaiken six and zero in his own right, looking for an ace in the round specifically. Shouda was down prior, is down on twenty HP as they try to aggress onto the site, but Eric, by pseudo aggression with the Tachanka Shumika launcher, will find and steal that ace away from the Jaeger. Nonetheless, a dominant round for UBC, and once more, they not only could complete the rotation, but find an extra, as worst is, um, good knighted? Is that a, is that a verb? Uh-oh. Hopefully you're back. Are we back? Hopefully oh, we're back. I hope you guys okay, can hear well, me. for the time being, <laughs> if you're not back, UBC basically as, about as dominant as things get, and we've been told that you are back, so high back treasure. Oh, he's, it's apparently not back. Apologies for that one. A few technical issues in the back line. Apparently the perfect time to have it, though, is Bradley's called a timeout. UBC's aggression on the defensive side. Seemingly not all that much met. Two players still yet to die. Egg, the only one to die twice. And the only reason Nico and Mad have died is because they've gotten over-aggressive. Nico trying to run in through bathroom, as we saw in the previous round. Two rounds prior, it was Mad trying to get aggressive around the back side on the bottom floor. And the question now remains here for UBC is, do you just continue with this aggression, or are you just chill on the site? Because Bradley don't really have an option to come back in either situation, and they seemingly don't have an answer. Uh, however, the pacifist being Cyclone, on the mountain maybe question mark maybe hopefully ah, he'll tell he'll tell us if it's a problem okay last map we had four Defenders, rounds in our protect your bombs from being defused by attackers yeah this is as far as our pattern seeking goes what we're really looking at for this round uh if we just look at the history it's more likely that bradley has used their timeout a little bit earlier it's good that they got their opportunity to take it right there, but they have to go upstairs on into initiation room to try and steal this one away from the University of British Columbia. Either way, though, it's looking a little dark for them. I feel like the sun has stopped shining. Lunar eclipse. It's the Death Star sitting in the sky. I, I, I don't know. It's not looking good. That's, I feel like that's the understatement of the day here in the NCC broadcast. And uh, we talked about the 15 round banger being a banger and being close. So that was already an understatement. Cyclone, hey, at minimum, make sure they don't get spawn peaked. That's a good start. They have the bond to shield up from spawn as they walk out. There's no way for them to fall with that out, though, but you'd think. But, you know, if anybody was to try and kill a monkey with a full shield up. Be I'm, uh, I'm always surprised. There's always something happening in this world that just spites God. Uh, not this time, though. Not this time. For now. Uh, so Cyclone moving up uh, across the roof, actually, uh, as far as we last saw. So they might be going for a drop down the hatch by yellow, potentially. Get their drums in uh, all the way, actually, to objective. So 
Uh, those mute jump jammers are giving them quite some relief. They have dropped that Montane shield and they've got location already on one player directly into initiation. And if they're able to move fast, they might be able to get this plant down before much problem comes from it. One player down in the first minute. And that's the pace that we've been seeing pretty consistently over this. And this egg doing it. He's got to get that KD up after <laughs> taking the kill or the deaths for his team as C4 gets ripped. That Monty has to go full fortification. I don't know if they'll be able to make it all the way in there. They're trying to clear that in a close corner, and Kike is so close from finding that kill ever so narrowly, but it's piercing to fall next. Finally a refrag, as Shouta will be able to get one back the other way. There are smokes available for Cyclone, as they also have the shield available, and the diffuser in their back pocket. Now would be the time to start to get that diffuser down with an EE1D popped, and they've also dropped the Vulcan shield inside a connector. No easy way to rotate here for Egg if they want to even try and get on the backside of initiation. There's no way to do so. While yes, it's a decent spot for them to be in, Cyclone's aggression may actually maybe drop from behind. Luckily, they turn around at the perfect time. Yep, he's just hanging on here, trying to suss out as many of the defenders as possible. Shouta is his sword at his back. Inglot takes out Linus, so he is truly reliant on Shouta to make these things happen. But with him going down, Eric taking out Shouta. Cyclone is fully on his own. He's got to make it happen with his pistol. <laughs> There's just too many of them. A valiant effort switching to the Montane, really playing around that. But without the plant going down, they ended up just getting stuck in initiation to die a little closer to objective. And two completely contrasting angles as well. About 180 degrees there between the Jaeger and the Goyo. Quite literally no way to stay alive there if you're the Monty, unless you knew both of them were going to be there ahead of time. And at that point, you could maybe find a corner. Even then, it's not a guarantee with explosives being a thing on the defensive side. Now five straight, breaking our streak of similarities between our previous map and here. And UBC will look to complete the rotation twice over as they head the sixth and final site, technically. To locate technically and third and final site for the second time on throw. Yeah, UBC making a magnificent display right here. Throne's going to be probably the easiest one to hold for them at this pace. It's just a few choke points last time. There was a hard breach that did go down on the, uh, what is it, the throne wall. Uh, I think not the yellow stairs. Uh, it did get opened up, but immediately we saw a lot. I mean, Eric has taken that clash. Uh, there's only two players left by the time walls were even opened up. So against the realm, really deciding the game before it's started. Clash looking to, oh, okay, get his way up on top of that. That's not what I thought it was. Five seconds remaining. So yeah, he's got to do a, a little bit of parkour to get up on top of the little fencing right there. The so we got a proper view of it for this time. Certainly special. I, I don't know how I feel about that because on one hand I love it because innovation in Rainbow Six Siege is always something that's difficult because of how much this game is freaking played. You can only do so much over so much time. I also don't believe they've cleared out what we is what is I I think maybe egg down below? It's no, it's the mute waiting down in storage on the bottom floor. There they are. They are droned and should be cleared out of position, whether it be with utility or gunfire. Maybe trying to aggress here. Sneaky angle attempted, certainly not completed. As they look to swing, they'll even find Linus. They know that the mute's there. They still are able to find the kill. Mad looking for a kill of their own is unable to find it, but damage at a minimum. Down to Shouta as they go down to 60 HP, and Bradley once more on this attacking side lose an early engagement and some. Sometimes even more passive piercing, also lucky to be alive, should probably go by a lottery ticket twice over as well. Maybe two seconds separating them from death in both C4 instances. Oh, that's three players downstairs all just staring down our player who's uh, still outside. Uh by them. The rest of the attackers for Bradley uh, still slowed down. They do have an opportunity if they would actually rush into site right now find a couple kills they would actually be home free with mad shiba eric and nikadem still all the way out here uh potentially by defuser uh, no nope, no nope. cyclone still got it so actually if they had the intel to work off of they've done this thing a few times where they stack up all go in the same place uh and nico is usually waiting for it and the thing is you can't stack up like it's it's okay sometimes but you have to have a pre-placed drone and you have to know that no one's there to oppose you and then you gotta be able to spread out pretty quickly if you just don't have the so confirmation dead. already you can't do it she's so dead 
Nico was watching that, and unfortunately the Maverick taking a little bit too much time and was too close to that. You can do that while prone, but with the vending machine or the arcade machine, whichever one it is, on the top side of that hatch, you can't get all the way into the back corner of both sides, so it's not easy whatsoever to get that open without possibly dying from the bracket's position. And already a disadvantage turned twice over here as Bradley, for I think the third or fourth time in six rounds, have lost both opening picks in a round itself. Piercing trying to find an angle onto this Clash as they try their best at flanking. But even then, as they start to do so, the Clash looks to back away. And there's no easy way in here for Bradley as with 30 seconds left, they're going to try to aggress. But even if that air jab starts to go down, I believe it's been circumvented. Nico, however, dying that was a way back in for Bradley. Yeah, there we go. They can even up the player count. Eric has to peel off. There actually is some prep for finding the flank both in time. Really counting low. That shield is going to do even more work than it has previously. He's got backup as well. Hard breach going off right now. He's going to force Egg to actually uh, point himself at that wall. He's going to kill a kill, but Shadow finds him as well. It's a 2v2. Matt Sheba finds the last two. He's got the shield that staunch stalwart ahead, ahead of him and he finishes this one out with a little bit of a collateral down the hall. And a clean shot across as well. You saw it was Shouda on the Ayana trying to retrieve the Diffuser, get behind Throne, but they thought one was behind Throne. That was their issue. You saw the hesitation. That was indeed their downfall. And this was worse downfall. Oh and six in the first half. Linus one and six. Cyclone three and six. Here are some of your uh, halftime splits in terms of KDs. And we'll go on contrasting sides because of how dominant this half has been for UBC. Not only in the fact that they're up 6-0, but the fact that still only two players have died once over. Eric has yet to die whatsoever. And worst player went from being the best player back on Villa to the worst player here on oh, Theme Park. Yeah, it looks like the sorry, I had defense sorry. of University of British Columbia is just incapable of losing on the defense this map. So we can get a from send him over to the attack side, see what they'll do over here. And they're looking at the potential for 7 owing this one, which would be a brilliant, brilliant start for them getting back into it with a positive win after having two losses in a row the last couple of weeks. This is exactly how they want to storm their way back into contention. It's week three. Things are starting to get a little bit more solidified as far as everyone's contention for the title by the end of the season. We're nearing the half the way apart. So each match gets more and more important from here. UBC really looking to turn it on and make themselves one of those contenders. I feel like already they are, but I'm I'm a little scared to some of the other teams in Legends if UBC has lost twice this season. That's what I'm concerned about. Linus, by That's the way, was trying their hand. That, that, Linus was trying their hand at uh, a spawn peak. Uh, Mad decided, no thank you. And already a man disadvantage. It was about, what, eight seconds between them walking out of spawn and Mad finding the opening kill? This is, uh, let's see, hold on, I gotta check my notes, I have an exact word for this. Um, not uh -oh. good. It is not good. It's a little better now. Worst player actually has a kill, but it, it was not good about eight seconds ago. Yeah, oh! Another kill coming out there for Bradley, but it's another trade once again. So, <clears throat> worst player here taken out in, uh, combination with Linus. <laughs> the attack still basically outdoors with four players already gone from the lobby. Four out of ten, we're working on some good numbers. It's probably going to be a fast round at this rate. And UBC, they want to go home here. Bradley, they want a quick victory. They want to bring this one up. They want to get something good to work with beyond this point. That's the Twitch drone finding its mark and getting destroyed. But the damage is already done. Wall is open and Nico has a line of sight here into objective. Cyclone has to watch a long angle here, but the fires from Shadow are going to bolster him. And they lost their flank watch, but they still have these claymores you can see being prepped. Kill back there for Bradley. It's a 2v3 as UBC. Well, yeah, they drop a little bit of their opening. The Jackal off the board, certainly not a good thing. And notably that Zofia also down, certainly not helping in terms of their fragging power. They still have Mad available. And Nico, even though they're playing a support operator, that being the Thermite, the 55611 is a better weapon than a lot on the attacking side. C4 is thrown through, but Nico's been playing their aim lab twice over, but it's Mad to find the kill. Nico drops the C4, Mad drops Cyclone. We've gone for the 2v3, now the 2v2, but piercing has a flank setup. There's the spray, but it doesn't hit. Nico makes it through, as does Mad. 
Oh, so close to having that perfect, perfect spot there for the defense. He's got to drop yeah, down exactly. in and try and find the attackers. The fire is going to find its mark. Shadow kills Nico flat out, but Mad has already gotten the diffuser down. He's got a quad kill right now. If he's able to get this, he's going to ace his way into a seven. Oh, if he can just beat out Shouta in this 1v1. But Shouta has the fire to work with. He's able to push up. He's able to find the kill. Double kill on the round. He's going to deny the seven. Oh, he's going to get that diffused for himself. And he's going to keep Bradley in competition for this map. At least one round of the you know, that's Bond two different rounds failed. in which a Tachanka win. has denied an ace, but in two completely different scenarios. First time was up top on initiation when the Jaeger, I believe, of Egg was denied the ace. No, it was uh, it was Nico, actually, who was trying to play on the Jaeger, I think. I think anyway, whatever Jaeger it was. ace denials tonight between these two matches that we've had just on this <laughs> stream. It was a wild that's amount. Insane. So many people getting so close to just rolling the lobby, and it's just not quite in these, like, wild 1v1s. You never know what's going to happen in them. So a big thing there for Shouta. Shout out to Shouta for keeping his team in there. That's that little glimmer that they need to try and put as many up on the board as possible. If it's not going to be a match win, if it's not going to be a map win, the round still counts, especially to his tiebreakers at the end of the season. So they're fighting for everything that they can get because it might really make a difference for them. You ever see those situations where it's like a team losing by three rounds in terms of round differential at the end of the season? And you're like, dang, how do you just drop three rounds at random points and think to yourself, dang, this could have been us making playoffs? Yeah, yeah, you, you just gotta like keep your head every single game. season. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you just got to know if you're going to have tiebreakers, everyone's got to count. you got to stay turned on the entire time. And sometimes if you're able to keep your mental game going, and this is a very mental game, Siege is. It's, it's long of rounds, it's long of matches, it's these late nights where we really forge some of the best teams. I don't know who I can say is the best team thus far through NECC, but tonight it's been UBC. Worst does pick up an opening though, dropping Nico. That's the lion down in the top frag right now, most importantly. The rest of the team fairly short behind, Mad up at 9 and 3, the rest of the team 6, 5, and 4 between Tyke and Egg and Eric respectively. But there's no short of fragging ability here for UBC, but dropping one of the main proponents of their success early on is certainly beneficial. It's a statement, at the very least. They got around, yeah. they got Nico as the first frag, but Linus here sitting right outside the window watching that pixel, looking for any bit of movement. I think you may have seen that gun. There's at least a, a flash of black on the screen and a distraction coming out from the other side for him. A whole window knockdown, making the sign cue at least. And Linus does get his kill there on Kaiken. I'm reloading. And a 5v2 now, not only do Bradley win the opening engagement, but two past that. Eric is down, Mads in a theoretical, now certain, one versus five. On the Flores, no less, the AR-33 is certainly a better weapon than, again, a lot on the attacking side. But a 1v5, a whole lot to ask from a, by definition, support player in terms of Flores himself. What? What? Huh? All right, all right. Just watch. No flawless there, but uh, the bullets are just not in their mark for either of these players all the way out here. It's going to take two runouts to finally finish that one out. I hate all the Rooney long range, so fair enough. Uh, can, can we clip it, that? It does so like one damage anything? per shot if you can land them. <laughs> can someone clip that and then like send it to me? Because what, what, oh, we're we seeing it right here. <laughs> Bloody yeah. thing. Oh, oh no. Oh no. I, I love this because. This is oh no, why, why are you making us watch this? Why are you doing this to us? <laughs> this is hilarious. I don't know what you're talking about. That's great. <laughs> I don't know how in the world piercing is just cut down. In all fairness, it's a what a 1.5 on the P10, which is a terrible gun from anywhere Defenders, past 20 years, unless you get a one-shot headshot, attackers. versus the AR-33, which has little to no recoil, a lot of weapon or a lot of bullets in the chamber, and um, it's just better and not an SMG. So I don't know. It's a certain trade-off, but come on. Mainly because I know you. Come on. <laughs> well, if it's three rounds deficit that we're looking to mitigate today for that playoffs opportunity, we're up two more from that flawless that we're staring down hey, the barrel of for Bradley, packing some more in for our tiebreakers, and with a nearly flawless, I mean, like, except for, like, controlling, like, piercing has no need to jump out. That was, for all intents and purposes, a flawless round last round. On the back of that last win, I think the pressure is a little bit off of UBC. They 
you know, just need one more, you know, like four more opportunities to do it. So they're not necessarily like sweating, sweating at this moment. They've got a little bit of reprieve seeing that match point, but they're gonna have to turn it on at some point in order to take this one home. Here's the way to do it. Linus is attempting a spawn peek. Nobody actually peeking from the bumper car side means no easy and early kill there for the Azami. They will unfortunately go kill us through the first 20 seconds, but you can see how prepped UBC seem to be. The Talon Shield whipped out here for Egg on the aggression from the attacking side. They're all prepping on the outside of Cafe as well. In goes that Rotero drone dropping the deployable shield and I believe that uh, Alibi Prisma on the backside of it. Early engagements going the way of UBC, not by kills, just by utility. Oh, that's nice seat forward there. Oh, shot out of the air though, but that would have actually blasted through the talent shield that Egg has and uh, ended one of the players really early. A run out of tempo where his player is going to prove fatal, though Eric's got a C4, or uh, Claymore prepped up over there, so none of that cheeky business. Swing from the MX4 Storm, not cheeky by any means. A double there for Cyclone. They're sending this attacking side into a hurricane level spiral just on the opposite hemisphere of the world. Eric, their swing forward, finds the refrag. Nika with a kill of their own from the five versus two, seemingly to the two versus two. UBC took what was a massive disadvantage and now equal things up right back to dead even, right outside of the site itself as well. And if you're Bradley here, you're like, what happened? Because you blink and you've lost three players. Yeah, as soon as they let up their guard, the refrags are just really clean. The communication coming out immediately from UBC. They're not letting anything go by the wayside. Some health taken out from that Shumika grenade, but not enough to take Eric out. He just has to step out and be a little bit weakened for this next engagement. It may be the thing that really costs him the round, though. He sees ahead at least the shoulder there for just a second. Doesn't quite find a way. He takes a tick of damage himself from the SMG, and he's run right up onto Shouta, who's got that brand new very nice brand new but relatively dragon knife for Deshaun gets his upgrade it's a trade i think nope maybe down nope. but he finds the body shots he needs to pick up the two kills hey they've completed the three rounds we said they would need in a metaphorical scenario of a possible late season playoff contention tiebreaker that was totally just pulled out of the back of my mind not actually a thing by any means this is still week three we're not congratulations on, on playoffs. playoff contention whatever yeah bradley basically making playoffs with that no i'm kidding not actually the case but hey rounds are rounds and tiebreakers matter here they are still three rounds away from bringing things back Defenders i will start to really believe if they win here because the last two rounds have been chaotic, but they've still been relatively clean from the start of the round. Later on, of course, getting a little over aggressive, maybe costing you. But here on Throne and Armory, this is the closest round thus far to a UBC win on the attacking side. If they win here, then they're putting UBC theoretically up against the ropes to at least force OT. Yeah, they... Three rounds, that's more than we really expect to see at all, especially with those six in a row. So making the most of this defense side, especially when it's UBC's chosen map, that's really something to see. Is, uh, you don't often see a team rally like this under the barrel, like looking directly at a 2-0 with a 7-0 map on it as well. So I really want to get a big shout out to Bradley. Like whoever's doing shot calling, whoever's keeping that mental together right now. Uh, worst player here is going for an ambitious one. He's waited a little bit to make sure that the guard has been dropped. He gets a drone and he gets a kill. Goes out for another one. He's getting a little bit greedy here, so he's going to lose some life, but still comes out massively positive for his time and effort. Hey, Mad drop this time. Instead of Nico in a spawn peak, it's Mad, but it's the Lion once more. That's actually back-to-back -back rounds off spawn peaks, specifically, there for the defensive side, where they drop the Lion, of which is a huge proponent of clearing out roams, of which Bradley's really been pushing off of. It's their roam play, notably on the top floor here for Throne, and a cross from the far side, unfortunately dropping the Gemini Replicator, that being the M7 of the Zofia. A little bit of friendly fire, technically, but it was onto a hologram. So, is it really friendly fire? Yeah, holograms aren't your friend. Don't trust robots. You're right. Whoa! What? Okay! Okay! Yeah. Flicking right around 180. Worst player didn't have a chance. He's gotten his value for the round, and he's done and dusted here. Okay, can Zebby will continue on keeping that KD positive, looking for more queries. He is sending his drone on in. Not much to speak of, Ooh, until just a little flash of blue. 
Cyclone's foot was caught in that, and a little bit of a flash of on, on his screen was technically black. Yeah, yeah. The feet. still notable, but Cyclone with a run out, dropping egg on that rappel. Not even a rappel. Were they a drone just chilling outside? How do you not only see that? Did they forget to take out a default cam? A I'm, I'm gonna be located. really upset if it was uh -oh, a default party cam. fell. Yeah, it's either that or just <laughs> checking outside, I guess. I suppose, but like usually you don't just run back. out. Oh. Unless you know. Attackers recovered the yeah, Diffuse has to be picked right back up. Oh, Eric's able to drop down, grab it. There's no one still watching, so he's going to see what his drone can do, see if he can find anything more to work I mean, with. He's got a little bit of support from up and behind. Oh, and Nico takes out Linus. Another defender taken out just a little bit away. He's trying to find that breach charge to take out someone said from above. I was actually caught out by that breach charge. A little bit of damage done, not all that much, about 14 or so. But it's still enough to push them out of position and really catch them off guard. Well placed nade will drop the Kiba barrier, of which Piercing was playing on the back side of. They'll be forced out behind the throne itself. The shot's just not landing here with the MX4 Storm. They're still trying to take out that Ayana, but they've been unsuccessful in their early attempts. Shouta trying to back out of sight, and they've done so successfully, but the entirety of the site defense has now been taken out. Cyclone finding a double kill in the round. Two more required, and 11 on the map already required here for the Malusi as they retake the site itself. The Kiba Barrio should restrict them in terms of trying to get on the site, and there's also an air jump up above them. You can hear it just pinging on their top side, and the comm is there here for the defense. They have to back away, and Cyclone's going to have to retake from the dragon side. Ooh, no walls open here. Drone gone, but I don't think anyone was on it. And with that silence, he's not giving much Ooh. away of his location. He's got 3Ks looking for that fourth one and looking to find the diffuser. He shouldn't have any information yet on it. He's just got to go on pre-fires instinct and making sure that he hits that head before he takes the single shot. He's putting the bullets where he needs Five to. Seconds. He's seen it, but it's not going to be enough. Eric finishes this one out in another stunning 1v1 post plant. It's not that 7-0 that it potentially was. It's a 7-3, though, with still absolute dominance from you. British Columbia. Five seconds also. Even if they win that fight, you have to find the diffuser, of which we knew was in the close corner around the dragon entrance, but it's so difficult in those extreme scenarios to try and clear out that information. And it became chaotic later on in the round because, well, you, if you're cycling, you've already found an opener as you ran out. You found a second as you found the refrag from that arcade side. But trying to retake the site as Diffuser's continually ticking down, and there's no way in for brackets because, well, not only is the Kiba barrier between you and the site itself, but there's an air jab up above your head that'll take you out, certainly, if you push forward. That was so much time off the clock, and it was put into such a time crunch for the Malusi, there was no way for them to pick that up. Yeah, so um, great place from Bradley. Try and bring this one back, but University of British Columbia look amazing right now they break that losing streak it's one and two from here on no more that oh and two records they'll be happy to see that i'm sure there's plenty of joy over there at university of british columbia for tonight uh, a great place from all of our teams that we've had tonight i do want to shout out our production team unnamed gamer and peak for bringing us all to you guys on the back end of course to you as well time to light so uh that will be the rest of what we have for tonight, of course, we'll be back next week, starting at the same time and the same tomorrow. place. Yes, and of course, every day of the week, we'll be having more NECC broadcasts, just not Rainbow Six for the rest. We get a little bit of variety. Of course, League of Legends tomorrow if you want to pick things up, not only here, but on the Stream as well, twitch.tv slash NECC underscore esports and NECC2, should you want to watch that League of Legends tomorrow. Don't miss it, because MOBAs are fun to watch, just not so much to play. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye. On top of the roof is quick get involved and the first gone fight of the day and that'll be quick bird utility with your